Okay, so I don't speak Pashto. This is not correct. I know a few words. I can differentiate between Pashto and Farsi, for example. So everything I did, I had a native speaking inter uh, interpreter with me. And depending on who I was speaking with, that person would interpret for me. So sometimes my interpreters said that they could speak Pashto and the first word out of their mouth was, do you speak Farsi? <laughs> Not in English, obviously. They, they would say that in Farsi. And I know enough that I know that they're speaking Farsi as opposed to Pashto. They're totally different language families. They really sound different. So I could call my interpreters when they were being disingenuous, you see. But I, I can't say I speak Pashto. And I, I took three months of Farsi, so I have a smattering of that, so I understand. My languages are French and German. I spent about three years on the continent, that means Africa, uh, interpreting all over from Morocco down to Congo. And that's where my language skills are. So this gig is not language. It's not interpreting. This is human intelligence, okay? All right. So that's my, that's my deal. I, have a, I, have a, I graduated with a degree in history, political science, dual major minors in philosophy, and I have tons of stuff with the military. So that's my gig. I kind of like this stuff. This is what I do. I'm into it, and I try to stay fresh. So that's my expertise, if you will, okay? Don't have a PhD, so sorry, but there we go. All right, this, this is, these are my objectives. I want to give you a, a solid uh, overview of what we're going to discuss in a very non what non-biased way as objective as I can so and you can come up with your own decisions if you have questions if you want my opinion I'll give it to you but my perf you know I'm not here to give you an opinion or to make you think a certain way I'm just going to tell you based upon what I know the history of the peoples and everything else what may or may not happen and what's going on all right so would you click if it clicks. There we go. All right, the first thing I want to talk about is the graveyard of empires. Have you guys heard of that phrase? Yes. People say that about Afghanistan. Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires, which means anybody who goes there, they're doomed to failure. This is a huge lie. It's absolutely, demonstrably, historically incorrect. And what I've done here is I put down all of the empires of the world which have conquered Afghanistan. And there's a lot. Alexander the Great. Okay, so you start the, the Mauryan Empire. These guys come out of India. Afghanistan is the, the culture, the mother culture of Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. And also Afghanistan comes from India. That's, that's their mother tongue. Like, we are Western Europeans. That's where we come from. That's where these guys come from. That's where their languages come from. That's where their culture comes from. Everything comes from that. So the Mauryans are the, the first ones. These are Indians who conquered Afghanistan early on. This is like 500 BC, okay? The Persians came in. They made the, the uh, Afghans uh, tributaries, if not actually conquering them, okay? So when Alexander the Great fought the Persians around 323 BC, there were Bactrian soldiers. Bactria is the old name for Afghanistan, which were in his armies fighting against the Greeks, okay? Because they were subsidiaries. They were satellite kingdom. Alexander the uh, Great conquered Afghanistan about that time. He spent three years subduing the tribes. He married one of the princesses. Her name is Roxanne. They had a baby together. And yeah, he definitely conquered them. If you go to, to Afghanistan, you can still see there are Greek coins that are in the sand. There are still traces of uh, that Macedonian kingdom more than almost 2,500 years ago. Uh, the Rashidun Caliphate, Caliphate, this is when the Arabs came. So the Arabs bust out of the Arabian Peninsula and they go, they go west, north, and east um, circa 7th century AD. And they go all the way into India, and en route into India, they go into Afghanistan, and they fight, and they conquer Afghanistan. That's why the Afghans are Muslim, because these guys conquered them, okay? They're not Arabs. Their language is not Arabic. They speak Pashto, Farsi, 
and myriad of dialects, and Arabic is not one of them. When they open up their prayer book and they're looking at the Quran, they don't understand anything they're reading. I never met one Afghan that can read Arabic. Arabic. Not at all. They just recite it, and they don't have any idea what it means. It's like if we were in the Bible in Latin. Most of us would have no clue what it means. That's the same thing that goes on. Okay? So the, the Arabs conquered. The Mongols come around 1200 BC. Genghis Khan, right? All these guys, they absolutely conquer Afghanistan. They trounce Afghanistan. And today, there are people living in Afghanistan who are a minority group. And during the previous uh, control of the, the Taliban, these guys were made slaves. They're Mongoloid peoples, right? East Asian people. They come from this time when the Mongols conquered Afghanistan. Question mark. Yes, please. Do these do these uh, Mongols do they live in a in an area or a region, or are they interspersed throughout? They, you can find them throughout. However, they do have their own little homeland. It's right in the center of the country. And if you remember, uh, it's a place where the Taliban blew the faces off the old. Um, uh, Buddhas, okay, that's that's where they live. So they're still there. They're very they were very strong allies of the United States, as they still are. They're very very pro American. Okay, so the Timurid Empire is another kind of Mongol, but they're more like Turks. They're probably the most brutal of all the Mongols. They definitely conquered Afghanistan. The Mughals came out of what is today. They're kind of an internal Afghan. They started in Kandahar, actually. And they went south and conquered India. And anyway, the Mughals controlled that. that. Mughal means Mongol, but they're not actually Mongols. Everybody wanted to claim the title of Genghis Khan, so everybody says, ah, oh, I'm Genghis Khan. But anyway, they're, they're ethnically different. Uh, talk about the various Persian empires. They definitely controlled vast parts of, uh, of that. The Sikh empire. Sikhs are the guys who sometimes you see with turbans, okay. right? They all carry, they, they carry it. They never cut their hair, the men. They always have to have a little dagger with them. Sometimes people think they're Arabs, they're not. They come out of India. They were the warrior class of uh, Indians. They have this very long tradition of being soldiers. Uh, Sikhs, so the Sikhs conquered. The British came, they fought three wars with the Afghans. In the first war, they got crushed. They lost like 7,000 guys. There's the story of the drummer that comes back. You know, he's the lone survivor. And the British go back and they beat the Afghans and they, uh, they divide up the tribes, they pick winners and losers. The British do empire very well, and they subdue the t Afghans, and they make it a tributary state, which keeps the Russians out, which was the great game, you may have heard of that. All right, the Soviet Union come in in 79, they do a standard blitzkrieg, like a really impressive blitzkrieg with everything. The tanks come, the paratroopers come, is like you know massive tactical air support, and they obliterate the uh, the opposition. They conquer the country rapidly, which in just a few uh, weeks, and they stay there for almost ten years until uh, eighty nine when they pull out. The reason they pulled out is not because they were defeated on the ground. Uh, Soviet Union lost about thirty five thousand soldiers over that ten year time pay period. Okay, 35,000 men is nothing to the Russians. The Russians lost 25 million people in World War II. 500,000 at the Battle of Stalingrad, 500,000 at the Battle of Berlin, multiple encirclement engagements with 600,000 dead in single battles. 35,000 soldiers over 10 years for the Russians is nothing. Okay, they did not lose on the battlefield. They never were defeated by the Taliban. Or, uh, or not the time, but the Mujahideen back then. Our guys, we, when we got involved with Reagan, we sent the, the, uh, the air-fired missiles and we took out helicopters and all that kind of stuff and we created a cost uh, ratio that was a little bit high for the, for the Russians, but they were never defeated. They were never defeated. The only reason they left is because Gorbachev realized that the United States and Reagan had called them the evil empire. They were trying to sell the regime, their way of life as just an alternative, communism, capitalism, communism's better, you should join with us. Reagan drew a line in the sand, he was pushing back, he was calling them out, tear down the wall, all this stuff, and when they invaded Afghanistan, look, here they are again. This is what they did in Czechoslovakia, this is what they did in East 
Germany. This is what they did in Poland. This is what they did everywhere. They're doing it again. These guys are bad guys. Gorbachev's trying to maintain a world reputation. Same time, his economy is under pressure from Star Wars. You may remember that. And they're trying to compete with the Americans technologically, which is really, really expensive because the Soviet Union, after World War II, had been on a full-time war economy. You know, guns and butter. So usually you, you either produce guns, which means you do all kinds of infrastructure and government expenditure, or you do butter, which means you let people have prosperity. So when you do war, you're in the guns area. And when you're in peace, generally, you, you make a small army and you let people prosper. The Soviet system, or the communist system in general, never goes to butter. It's always in guns, which means all they do is they produce lots of military equipment, lots of things for the state, and the people stay forever poor. Okay, so one of the big draws for communism is that someday there's gonna be a utopia. The utopia doesn't happen for 70 years. People start to get annoyed, especially after there's been tens of millions of dead, starvation, all kinds of stuff. So Gorbachev, you may have remembered his words, perestroika and glasnost, this was the opening, right? And we're gonna allow a little bit of freedom so people can start to have little family um, gardens and a little bit of freedom of the press, some criticism, things like that. All of this, yes, sir? Uh, why did the Soviets invade Afghanistan? Okay, so Afghanistan is, is a country which is in itself, well, at least in the past, was in, unimportant, largely. But Afghanistan is a, is a area which not only is just another group of people that can be converted to communism, but it's a way to get a, a port on, if you move through it, through Pakistan, you can get a port on the, on the Indian Ocean. So Russia, even though it's a huge country, the largest in the world, has very few really good ports. In the Crimea, they're locked in by the Turks in the Black Sea. <coughs> on the east, in, uh, in Siberia, they, uh, their ports are frozen in and the Japanese are there, traditionally. And the Japanese always hemmed them in, right? They fought a war with Japan in 1904, they lost. That's how Manchuria, they lost Manchuria. Uh, and then in, in, the, in the north, they had Leningrad. Leningrad was built by Peter the Great. It was Petrograd or Petersburg today. And then it went to Leningrad, now it's back to Petersburg. So that, that city is on the Baltic and that was another way to get into the ocean, but who controls that? The Germans. <laughs> so the Germans have an excellent navy, at least traditionally they do, and you can't get through the Straits of Denmark with, without those guys saying yes. So they're blocked, and then they have the north, and the, nor and the north is just frozen in Murmansk and everything like that. It's frozen all the time. So they're hemmed in. They have no real access to the sea. So the Russians are always obsessed with getting access to the sea because the sea is how you get out. That's why they were very much involved in the Syrian situation earlier. Syria is in the Mediterranean, and if they get Russian boats on the, in the Mediterranean Sea, they've got access to the Mediterranean. They want to make a base there. They still do. Okay? So the reason for going to Afghanistan is, one, to just expand the communist empire, and two, the, the, the government there was pro-Soviet. But the mullahs, just like in Iran, just like in Iran, we have the Shah in Iran. Shah was very secular, pro-American, and the mullahs are really fundamentalist, and they wanted to overthrow him, and they did, right? Khomeini came back from Paris, and they had the revolution, also in 79, and Iran changed hands and went to the situation it is today. So in Afghanistan, you have a similar deal. You have a secular government mm -hmm. in Kabul. Sometimes you see photos of girls in miniskirts in the 60s walking down, right? <laughs> And that was true because it was a secular little society and the people were freaking out. The people, I mean the mullahs and the, the Afghanistan is an amazingly conservative, fundamentalist Islamic culture. And so people didn't like that and so the, they started rebelling and they were going to overthrow the president of Afghanistan who was a communist, pro-Soviet uh, Union. So they, he said, we need help and the Soviets blitzkrieged in and they took the country, okay? All right, so uh, the, the Russians decided to leave because, not because they were beaten by, the, by the, the tribesmen, by the Mujahideen, but they decided to leave because 
they, the risk reward was just not good enough. They're not getting anything out of Afghanistan. They're losing world credulity. At the same time, their economy is starting to suffer, and it costs a lot of money to leave 100,000 soldiers in a, in a country and fight a war all the time. So they pulled. But they weren't defeated. <laughs> so there's no graveyard for the Russians in Afghanistan. You're not going to see rows of Russian graves in Afghanistan. Not. They killed 2 million Afghans. Okay? 2 million. That is an opposite of a graveyard for the Afghans. You go, when I was there, you would find mines all over. Afghanistan is the most mined country in the world at the time I was there. It's a little bit less so now. Russians specifically made mines that will look like toys to blow the hands off kids. They went in hard. That's the, Russian, the way the Russians fight. Okay? So, the Soviet Union conquered, and then left, and finally we came in. And we crushed the Taliban when we came in. You know, it took weeks to defeat the Taliban. And we did it with 1,500 soldiers. Okay? That's it. 1,500. That's it. Mostly spec ops guys. And allied with the uh, Farsi-speaking Northern Alliance. Okay? So you may see movies about the guys with the, riding the horses and stuff like that. That actually happened. That's what they did. All right, so these are all the times. There is no graveyard empires. I want to destroy this myth now. It's gone. It's buried. Thank you, sir. In between these empires, did the empire go from one empire to another, or did the empire and then it kind of wilted back to just Afghanis, mm. and then another empire came in? Or yeah. did it, was the empire crushed another empire mm. who just happened to be in Afghanistan? No, it depends. This is, a, this is 25 years, 100 years of history. Right. So Afghanistan was, like I say, after Alexander the Great, for example, there was a Greek state called Bactria, I already mentioned it once, which existed in Afghanistan. And yeah, they were, they were primarily Greek culture mix with Afghan culture that existed for, I don't know, 100 years, something like that. So there are various times when, when the, Afghanistan is a really, really, it's like Switzerland, except as big as Texas. So it's one small, Afghanistan's larger. Mm -hmm. But it is, the reason it's so divided and there's so many different tribes is because of the mountains. They're at the, uh, the foothills of the Himalayas. The mountains look just like ours, exactly like ours, except they're another 5,000 feet higher. So when you go out and you look at them, you go, wow, that's Utah, except that's Utah. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're bigger, right? And they go up 30,000 feet if you just cross over a little bit. So they're really big mountains, but they're split all over the place, and there's tribes located all over. It's very clannish, and that's the way the Swiss are with their cantons, right? That's why Swiss history is the way it is. It's because it's all about the local group. That's why there's so many dialects in Switzerland. Similarly, in Afghanistan, there's tons of dialects, aside from the two major languages that I, that I mentioned. So they've always been kind of divided, even when they're nominally a country. You, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, sweet. Would you click it? Did this computer come over on the Mayflower flower? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> all right, here's the other thing. Endless wars. Let's talk about endless wars. You hear this all the time, right? Time, it's endless wars. It's time to bring everybody home. Endless wars, endless wars. All right. Iraq and Afghanistan are not wars in any kind of classical sense, at least as we think of as wars. First of all, we never declared war. So it's not a constitutional war, that's the first thing. Secondly, if we look at blood and treasure, yeah, you hear those terms as well, very little has been expended in, by the United States in the last 20 years in either Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, we'll see another slide, it's like $2 trillion over the entirety of that time, that's not a small amount, but it's spread over 20 years, okay, 20 years. And the number of people who have died, I've got another slide that will show you that as well, just in terms of American soldiers, is less than 5,000 for both wars. Okay, put that in context. There are 330 million Americans today. 330, more than that. We're, we're rising. COVID killed a little bit of us, but we're still <laughs> pumping them out, okay? So we're rising. In, in, uh, on, the Norm on the Normandy la landings, in one day, 2,500 Americans were killed. One day, 2,500 when we went on. At the Battle of Antietam during the Civil War, okay, 
bloodiest day in American history. We had 23,000 casualties and about 7,000 dead. It's more north than south. At Gettysburg, in three days, you had 50,000 Americans shot down in three days. So 5,000 people over 20 years is not a huge number of people. So you say, yeah, every death, every death, absolutely. But there's 330 million of us. At the time of the Civil War, to put things more in perspective, right, uh, there were, let's see, there were 8 million people, no, 12 million people living in the South, I believe, and 20 million in the North. And that figure rose depending on immigration during the four years that we were there. Okay? So that's a total of about 35 million people in the entire country. One-tenth of what it is today, and the casualties during a single battle were exponentially higher. Okay? So the perspective is important when we talk about war, when we talk about death, when we talk about these things. I, it, because of media, it feels very close, but there's seven billion people on the planet. That's not a lot over 20 years. In the last, in the last um, since 2014, you were, uh, let's see, let me not get ahead of myself. 2,500 troops on the ground during the first year. Okay, so this is where we went. We went 1,500, then we went 2,500. I'm going to show you another slide which shows the, how that went. The costs go up, yes. And by the time we leave Iraq, we had 50,000 right before President Obama pulled everybody out of Iraq. We had 50,000 soldiers on the ground, and none of them were dying. Casualties had gone to zero, except maybe by an accident. No hostile fire deaths in Iraq. And then we pulled out, and what happened? We got ISIS. You remember that? Mm -hmm. That's what. That's exactly what happened. So it's something to remember when when you do a sudden pullout of any place, not just in the United States. All right. Next one, please. All right. So this shows deaths, right? In Iraq. This is just Iraq. 2003, 2020. You can see how many people by year until we get to 4,431. Now, there are contractors that are Americans who died in Iraq and Afghanistan, several thousand of them. They're also Americans, but they weren't soldiers, so you can count them as well. Most of them are ex-soldiers who became contractors, okay? But this show, 2012, two. 2014, and this is not hostile fire, okay? So when you see a death like this, Maybe two thirds of those are hostile fire. One third of them are, uh, they fell out of the truck. They got, you know, in a fight, somebody killed them, you know, one of their buddies, uh, they fell down. Something happened and they died. They got a heart attack for some reason. That happens a lot. I'm gonna show you another slide that, that makes that point. Okay, so a high point, this is the high point, 904, 2007, that's right before I went over to Afghanistan, a thousand people in one year. Again, context, try and think of context. I'm gonna show you another slide. Next one, please. All right, so here's Afghanistan. You can see a similar kind of thing. We never lost as many soldiers in Afghanistan as we did in Iraq. But you can see how it goes up. We'll get the surge, things start coming down until you get to almost none. And again, when you see 17, most of those guys are accidents by this point. There's like one or two that are hostile fire. Okay, all right. And then this is now, we have 13, that just happened. All right, next slide please. How many Americans will die each year in non-overseas contingency? Yeah, this means at Hill Air Force Base. This means at Rammstein, Germany. This means anywhere in the world that we have soldiers and they're not in hostile fire, how many of them get killed? So since we have been over there, you have about, well, 13, this is 13, it's about 15,000. Since 2000, if you, depending, 2003, you go back. Every year, 918 soldiers die. 918, they just die for any reason. 
Now, how many did we lose in Afghanistan last year? 2,200. One. Oh, last year. Last year. Oh, last year. <laughs> this is in one year. We lose almost 1,000 guys in a year who just die. Not from being shot, not from hostile fire, just life kills you eventually, right? Training and they die. Training. Training accidents, yeah, some helicopter falls, whatever it is, they kill them. Okay, so that, that's more, that, that's more than we lost at the peak in Iraq during, during the, per, um, the surge. Right around there, 900, right? That was the one that we saw. And we never lost that many in Afghanistan. Right? Not even half in a single year. All right, so that's perspective. Death is death, in my view. You can die in many ways. So as a, as a, as a soldier, I would rather die defending my country than die like my dad did at 82 and he can't remember his kid's name and he can't make it to the bathroom and he's in, you know, under ooze for, for, for <laughs> elders and he dies. That's not an honorable death. For me, I prefer fighting my enemies. So I would much rather prefer being shot by the Taliban and I die with a, with a, with a flag over me than in one of the myriad ways that almost all of us die. That's my personal opinion, and, and that's the only one I'm gonna give you, hopefully, okay? <laughs> all right, next one, please. Worldwide, this is also something that's interesting to, to note. So at any given time, right now, these are the soldiers that we have all over the world. Now, look at places like there, Japan, Germany, South Korea, Italy, when did we start, when did we occupy these countries? 45. Yeah, well, World War II and Korea, uh, 1953. Mm -hmm. We've been there for more than 70 years in each case. Mm -hmm. We have more soldiers in all of these countries than we did in Afghanistan since 2014. Yes, ma'am? Well, somebody on, uh, one of my friends said, how come we're leaving this many people in those countries mm -hmm. and we're totally pulling out of, of Afghanistan, mm. and I told them because, and tell me if that was right, yeah. because we are in a truce with those people. We, we're, we're at a truce peace. with these people? At, at peace with those. Okay, we're so not that, at that, peace in Afghanistan. Absolutely. So, no Japanese are firing at us. No Bahrainis are firing at us. No Turks are firing at us. That's a, that's a legitimate point. Nobody is, is shooting at us in, in any of these countries. Well, maybe in Jordan. There's a, there's a little bit of that. You get combat pay if you go to Jordan. So, and Djibouti. Um, there's Iraq as well. So we still have these guys in Iraq right now, okay? In Iraq and Jordan, because of ISIS, right? So that's a legitimate point. There's a difference. Afghanistan and Iraq are technically war zones. You get combat pay when you go there. Uh, you're exempt from taxes. There's a bunch of different things that come in when you go. And uh, yeah, you get a combat patch when you come back, if you're in the army, that says you've been in a war zone. That's all true. But when we, when we say, what does it mean to be in a war zone? Does that mean that you fix your bayonet and you're, you know, you're up over the trenches and you're charging machine guns? No, I never did that. <laughs> and nobody else that I knew ever did that. Here's, here's a stat for you. Out of all the people that are in the military today, only 60% of the, that group over the past 20 years have actually deployed to a war zone. Only 60%, 40% have not. They stayed in the United States or elsewhere. Of that 60% who deployed, only 10% of them are war fighters. That means they're kicking indoors and shooting people in the face. How many? 10, 10%, 10%. 10 that's it. So if you have 100,000 men in Iraq, like we did, 10,000 of them are actually fighting guys, shooting and being shot at. That's it. 90% of them are, are support guys. Like me, I was an intel guy. I was what they call a phobic. You're on, <laughs> you're, you're, on the, uh, you're on the base, what we call the FOB, forward operating base. You're on the base and you're not leaving generally. I did sometimes, but you're a phobic, right? You're a hobbit, you're a phobic. It's, you know, it's a joke, right? Okay, roll those dice. And see what okay, so <laughs> those guys are not out facing death all the time. Yeah, you, you get rocket fire, 
Sometimes people attack the perimeter. I mean, there is danger for sure. Things happen. Suicide guys drive up, they blow up their, their truck at the gate or something like that happens. But it's not World War II. It's not World War I. It's not Gettysburg. No aerial attacks. No, we have complete dominance of the air. So there is zero chance. Well, you have, like I say, mortars or missiles that can come in. But aside from that, nothing, nothing like that. Right? You're not enduring 72 hours of artillery bombardment from 120 million howitzers from the Germans. None of that is happening. So this is, this, this, when we call this war, you have to say, compared to what? Compared to what? What is real war, right? What is war? Certainly, if you're, if you're out there and you're in the Korengal Valley and people are shooting at you every day and you're shooting back, yeah, that's war. Absolutely, you're engaged. But for the vast majority of people who are on the ground, that was not their experience. That was not their experience. It was not my experience. I think what I did was important in its own way, but I was not out killing people. I never shot my weapon, and nobody shot at me as far as I know, aside from rockets and stuff like that. Yeah. Maybe this is getting ahead, but why did we ever go to Afghanistan? Why did we go to Afghanistan? We went to Afghanistan because a 9-11 happened when the two towers went down. The guys who trained were overwhelmingly Saudis. They were Arabians. There were no Afghans that flew the planes into our buildings. But those guys, the Al-Qaeda guys, they trained with Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan, and they were protected by the Afghan government. And once those towers went down, they went back there or, well, not those guys, they were all dead. But the Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, and his, his headquarters, his guys were in Afghanistan after 9-11, and President Bush said, we want those guys. And he requested of the Taliban to surrender them. And the Taliban refused. And he requested multiple times, and they refused multiple times, and so we went in to get them. We went to Afghanistan for two reasons principally. One, to kill Osama bin, kill or capture Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, dismember it as much as possible, and two, to deny Afghanistan to the world as a safe haven for terrorism. Those are our reasons for that. We went there. No other reason. That's it. That's why we continue to occupy it until the present day. And since that time, we have not been attacked like 9-11, nothing close to it. And if you remember, I certainly do, the day after 9-11 and for the next weeks afterward, all the newspapers in the United States were saying, this is the new normal. It's not uh, if we will be attacked, but when. They all said that. You can go look at New York Times, you can go whatever. Mm -hmm. So everybody anticipated that we were about to endure multiple uh, attacks from, from Al Qaeda and other kinds of terrorist groups. And it never happened. It didn't happen because we took the war to them and we killed them in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's just the basic reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, Did, is that right? Is that okay? Sweet. All right, so here's, here's our guys. We've got 200,000 people all over the world. We've been there for 70, 80, 70 years, for most of it since the end of World War II, and we continue to be in those places. Remember, this is Imperial Japan. This is Nazi Germany. This was dictatorship of Korea. This was fascist Mussolini Italy. This was the king and, you know, the prince, you know, whatever, okay? Uh, <laughs> a lot of these countries were not democracies when we went there. Many of them are democracies today. Just something to remember. All right, would you hit the next one? Cost of war, $2 trillion over 20 years. You can double that if you want to add in all the ancillary expenses that come with the VA and all that kind of stuff for treating people with PTSD, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some people say it will be up to $4 trillion to pay for all the uh, subsidiary or follow-on costs for Iraq and Afghanistan. Next one. Yes, sir. To put that in perspective, that's $300 million a day. It's $300 million a day. For 20 years. If you, if you do it that way. However, that's a little bit disingenuous because that only works if, if you have, if you have the, the reason that we have that, that sum is because we had a lot of people in, in those countries at certain times. 
But if you look at the costs at, say, the beginning and the costs at the end, they're vastly reduced. So at the time of the surge in 2008, 2010, when you had 100,000 soldiers in Iraq, later we did that in, in Afghanistan as well, the costs were high. But when you have 1,500 guys on the ground, 2,500 guys on the ground, at the beginning and the end, the costs are, are comparatively quite low. Yes, sir? Also, how much of that cost do you think includes rebuilding Iraq and Afghanistan? Yeah, that, that is included in, in those figures, when the, when the, in the two trillion. So it's not really a huge amount. I, I was looking over it, but I didn't include it in the slideshow. And there are multiple billions that, are, uh, that have been provided to, to rebuild and infrastructure and all that kind of stuff. But it's not huge. It's not a huge amount. Most of this cost is just paying soldiers to, to be there. One soldier, one American soldier in Afghanistan, a private, probably makes on deployment, I don't know, $50,000 a year. No. Yay? No. Yay? Well, for a private, it is. If you're 18 years old and you get 50 grand a year, tax-free, that's not a bad deal. Well, I won't go. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of 19-year-olds who will. You go, Ron. There's a lot of 19-year-olds who will. All right, yeah. You're a captain, you're making, what, 120? So, I would think when you're there, there's almost no expenses, right? There's zero expenses. So, yeah. so it's all going in the bank. You, you, there's nothing to, to spend. Your food is 24 seven. You can wake up at 2 a.m. and you can go to the chow hall and you can eat. And the food is good. But do they get a salary, the, the, the families at home with kids? I mean, their families no, you, be paid? Well, if you, if you have, do you know what I mean? if you have, well, when I was there, my family was here. Yeah. And I set up all that so that everything is being paid out of my, um, my bank account as normal. Yeah, Just like if I was here. But then 50000 is not a lot to live on. Depends on what your expenses are. Depends on what your expenses are. And most, most guys that are young are not married. And they have that expensive car. So yeah. it's okay. the, the vast majority of soldiers, this is, this is true. You probably see this on the Air Force all the time. The first thing that soldiers do when they come home from deployment is they buy a new car. $30,000 car. Yeah, that's what they do. They go and spend Because they don't have anything else. They have no expenses. I mean, there are exceptions, absolutely. And, and it can be, you know, everybody's different. You're right. Yes, sir? I work with a guy who was in the Navy mm. and um, as a you know, single guy mm. on, a, on an aircraft carrier. And they got nothing to spend their money on. Zero. And so when they made a port of call in, uh, I guess it was Dubai or wherever the Burj Khalifa is, they, yeah. they all got together and, and bought a condo. That's what the they Khalifa. did. That's exactly so, what soldiers did. That's exactly what they do. I had one guy, he got, this is when I was in Germany, when I was uh, before all of this kicked off, right? And they were given bonuses, re-up, you sign up again, and to be a tanker, that's what I was originally, I was in the tanks. So to be a tanker, if you signed up for another six years, you get $25,000. It's in the 80s, 1988, that, that was good. That was, that's a chunk of change, okay? So my driver, my driver, he did that. And I was with him, and I said, well, what'd, you, what'd you do with your re-up money? What'd you do with it? He goes, oh, sir, I, I went to Hamburg for three days. That was amazing. Oh, boy. Three days, 25 grand. <laughs> Those are his expenses. There you go. Hey, Mark, yes, sir. speaking of money spent in Iraq, yes. so the news says now that there's about 80 to $85 billion of equipment that we yeah. have there. Yeah. So I've heard multiple people in the Biden administration, including President Biden, say... Mm. We knew that the Taliban would take over the country. Right. We didn't know it would happen this fast, but it's certainly by the end of the year. Sure. If they knew that was going to happen, did they not have the foresight to see all that equipment going into the hands of the Taliban? Yeah. And why? So that, that, that's a good question. In the first deal, the, that figure, 90 billion roughly, 89, right, is the total amount of equipment that we have given Afghanistan over 20 years which also includes uh, training for, for personnel and all that sort of stuff. It's not just equipment, okay? So it's a little bit of a disingenuous figure. Uh, also, so, yeah, there are tens of thousands of trucks, there are thousands of Humvees, there are up to 120 aircraft, which is mostly helicopters, 
Four C one four C one thirty. Yeah, so there's various things. Right. A lot of those actually were disabled. If you're reading the news reports now, many of them are no mas. They don't, they're they're not going anywhere, and they don't have the expertise to repair them, which is one of the problems that we can discuss as well. But the Afghans, one of the reasons that the army crumbled so rapidly, is once we pulled out, the contractors who are essential to maintaining the aircraft were going to leave as well, which meant that none of the aircraft could fly. So without you know, it, you would know oh, yeah. when an aircraft flies, there are so there's so much time of maintenance that has to be done to that aircraft to get to fly well, again. And, and so there was some friends of mine that were going to get paid two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year right. to go over there to be a contractor right. and work on the airplanes that are over there right. to help the Afghans take care of those airplanes. That's right. Well, and you know, I was thinking too that a lot of that equipment has to have ground computerized support that it links to or tells it where to go. I mean, they're, they're, everything has got, you know, connected to something. Not right? everything is really high tech like that, sadly. No? Oh, some okay. things are, some okay. things are. So can those, those Taliban guys yeah. even operate some of this equipment? They can, they can operate the, the Humvees and the trucks. Right. They're good at driving those around. They know how to operate a motorcycle. Yep. They're famous for little red Yamahas. They do those well. Um, and they're, and they, they got a pilot. And the, that, the guns, they can operate all Absolutely, those. they can operate that until they jam. Then they're going to have trouble because an AK doesn't jam, but an M16 <laughs> does. So <laughs> they're going to have to learn how to clean those, those rifles. They're going to probably just bang them against a tree. Yes, so ma'am. I thought we were there to train these Afghanistanis, or whatever how you Yeah, the it, Afghans. To, uh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, to, to operate those airplanes. So yep. what did we do there to train them? Nothing? No, Just they do. Shoot a gun? They do, but technical expertise is not something that is easily acquired. We grow up, all of us grow up, and our fathers and grandfathers, we have a mechanical concept in our brains almost from the time that we can breathe. The first thing that you do when you pick up stuff, you start picking up tools. You, you go out and you see your dad start a car. You see, you see people open up the and put oil and gas in it. Okay, imagine that you've never had any experience like that. Imagine your experience is goats, maybe a horse, sheep. sheep. You know, it's a traditional agricultural experience and you have no concept how the mechanical world works. You can't read oh. and you can't write. Oh and you don't know how mathematics works oh. at all. And when I say mathematics, not mathematics, I should say arithmetic. Your counting skills are as many toes and fingers as you have. Okay. You don't know how to multiply, you don't know how to divide. You, fractions are something you've never heard of and you have no concept of. And when people say, how many did you see? You say, a lot. Because <laughs> you don't know. Yes, sir. So will the void or the gap there in technological support be mm. filled by the Soviet Union? Or China. China. Will, will it be filled or will it be killed? What did you say? Well, will, will they come in and teach so, uh, them how to put gas in the, in the helicopter and how yeah. to fly it? So, so that depends. I would doubt that the Russians want to come back in. I would doubt that they would after their experience. Certainly, they establish an a embassy and maybe have some kind of a trade relationship or something like that. But I doubt they want to take over Afghanistan again or that they want to have a significant uh, role in managing the country just because of their experience. The Chinese are interested in the raw materials in Afghanistan. So Afghanistan is sitting on a treasure trove of minerals. The, the geological surveys that the United States and Soviet Union have done, both countries, are estimate that there's something like three trillion worth of precious gems and gold and silver and lithium in, in uh, <coughs> Afghanistan. It is like a miner's paradise. So the Chinese are hungry for all that and they have been wanting to mine there for a long time. But you can't mine unless there's stability. So if the Taliban can provide stability, we may see Chinese miners going in and opening up, uh, opening up mines. And, and providing some technical experience. But the Chinese, you must remember, what's going on right now in China with the Uyghurs? We have a million Uyghurs, which are Muslims, living in Xinjiang province, which is in the north, borders Mongolia, right up there in the north, that are basically in concentration camps. 
Okay? A million of them. And why? Because they're Muslim. The Chinese are afraid that the Muslims are going to explode. They don't, they don't want that to happen. Okay? So well, if you get too if you get too cozy, this is the way the Chinese are going to think, I'm pretty sure. If you get too cozy with the Afghans, who are the Taliban, who are extremely militant, jihadist, and they somehow export that into China, China doesn't want to deal with that. So they have to be really careful on how they deal with the Afghans. I'm sure this is the way they're thinking. Does that make sense to y'all? So it's complex. Things could happen, but it's complex. All right. So, yeah, da, 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 da. Man, money. Next slide, please. Troops in Iran, 2001. Okay, we talked about this a little bit. You can see the rise, 1,300. We're down to 20,000 by 2004. Next slide, please. And we see it go up. It hits in 2010. We had 100,000. I was there during that time. We killed Osama bin Laden. And then we start to see this massive decrease pretty quickly. By 2014, less than 10,000 soldiers in the country. Last year, 2,500. This year, 2,500 until the pullout. So that is not very many guys. That's not very many guys. That's less than one brigade. I don't know if you know anything about military structure, but that is not a lot of guys. And remember, how much, what percentage of those guys are war fighters? 10%. That's it. So you get 250 guys that are trigger pullers, and the rest of them are just combat service support. Now, all of them can shoot, for sure. We, we all do that, but they're not trained in infantry tactics, okay? So that's a, that's a, it's a different beast. Anyway, next slide, please. U.S. losses in Afghanistan. Again, this shows you all kinds of losses, not just um, uh, green suitors. So you can look at that. When people say that the Afghans don't fight, <coughs> it's a lie. The Afghans have lost exponentially more people than we have at the same period of time. And they will fight, and they have fought. And they fought very bravely and very strong, especially their commandos. There's about 20,000 commandos, and they are uh, the equivalent of spec ops. Okay, So they worked and they were trained by our spec op guys. They're not exactly the same level, but they are hardened, tough fighters, and they fight really well. And some of those guys right now are in the Panjshir Valley resisting the Taliban fighting again. So the idea that, it, yeah, the whole Afghan army just collapsed, yes, it did. Why did it collapse? Primarily because the United States said, we're pulling out. We're pulling out no matter what. We're taking our contractors with us, and that meant no tactical air support, that meant no logistical support, and the entire 20 years that we've been there, we have trained the Afghan army under that circumstance. We trained them how to fight with artillery, with tactical air, with all of the stuff that we use. When our guys are out on a patrol and they get hit and they get pinned down, first thing they do is they're on the radio and they're calling out coordinates for an airstrike or an artillery attack. That's the first. What's that? Go go there we go. Bring in the, bring in the warthog. Yeah. So that's the first thing they're doing. And that's what the Afghans did as well. They call in and they get in and boom, boom, boom. And they take out the Taliban and everybody goes home. Yeah, that's good. But, but, but here's the thing I think. What, and obviously we should have known when we, when we announced in July, oh yeah, they'll be around for a while, at least till the end of the year. Baloney. Mm. How would they, if we pull everything out, how can they stand up for so, themselves? Okay, so this is, this is a question of, of the thinking of our leadership. So the Biden administration decides we're going to pull out. Trump administration also said we are pulling out. Yeah. Trump was gung-ho to pull out. I know it is. Right? And in fact, he, released, he forced 5,000 Taliban prisoners to be released as part of the Doha Agreement. I don't know if you know about that. But yeah. Those guys are radicals. Those are the guys that I was interrogating. Those guys are radicals. And we released them into the wild. Sure as can be, those guys found their way back to the battlefield. Sure as can be. Trump did that. You should remember that. Trump was go, go, go. We want out, we want out. But he never did. Why did he never do it? Because <laughs> calmer minds reminded him, this is what can happen if you pull out preemptively. And he knew that because he had watched what happened in Iraq. When we pulled our guys out of Iraq, Immediately there was a power vacuum and it was filled by really nasty people. 
And then Trump had to send more troops back into Syria to blow out ISIS and kill Baghdadi and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. You heard about that. He knows that. He knew that then. That's why he didn't fully pull out. But Mr. Mr. Biden came in and he was determined to pull out. If you look at his campaign speeches and all that, he, has, he decided he was gonna pull out. And the timing of this very likely is, was time for political considerations with the anniversary of 9-11. I would guess. I would guess. I don't, I'm not in his mind, so I don't know. And Bart, tell him about, we talked about this before we started the meeting. Tell him about the, what the media today are calling Americans in Afghanistan. Define those people. So I, I haven't seen any stats on it, but I would just guess what that, what that means. Usually when, you, when you're looking at a foreign country, and, and you have something going on like this, and they're talking about Americans being trapped or whatever, almost all of those people are dual citizenship individuals. They're Afghans with American citizenship, which means they're Americans, right? They have, a, mm -hmm. they have the same passport as I do, but most of them were probably born in Afghanistan. Most of them, their families are still in Afghanistan. They have maybe land in Afghanistan. They have businesses in Afghanistan and they're not going to leave. And then the cause people, the UNICEF people. Right? So there are, there are other people that are on the ground in all over the world who have devoted their lives for a particular cause. And I was telling Howard, these are true believers. So this is Médecins Sans Frontiers, this is the UN, this is the Red Cross, the International Red Cross, this is um, all manner of groups, and they are do-gooders. They are people who want to change the world, and they are invested. They're dealing with orphans. They're dealing with women that have had acid sprayed in their faces. They're dealing with, with child rape victims, and they are doing the Lord's work. They're doing whatever it is on the ground. They've been there for 20 years, and they are not going to leave their people. So when they got warned, we're pulling out, they're not leaving. They're, right? Isn't is, that, that's probably right. Yeah, this is my guess. I've seen zero stats so on it. I think there's one American, American that's stuck in there. One white person who wants to leave. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do we? Do we think that? Not many, right? Certainly, the, they're, they're very likely there's somebody like that. Like very that likely there's at least one, yeah. okay? Yeah. There's some Western person who wants to leave, and for whatever reason, they're in a bad way, and they can't get out. But I would doubt that there are very many of people like that. I mean, maybe a handful, a dozen, I don't know. I don't know. And there, I could be wrong because there might be some enclave that's trapped somewhere. And for some reason, you know, a hundred people just can't get out. I don't know. It's, it's the, the country is closing. We don't know what we don't know. What are your thoughts on the Afghans? You hear a lot about the Afghans who helped the U.S. forces, work yeah. closely with us, yeah. who are now stuck over there. It seems like those numbers are pretty high, at least what I've read. Okay. Your thoughts on that? And how so, that's yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see. I have another, I don't know, slide. If you click that one, let me just see if it comes up. I says, I'll only talk about that too. Um, so, the, I have a slide on here which is about refugees and displaced persons. So, there are they're estimated to be 100,000 that are coming to the United States. There are probably millions that are going to Pakistan and Iran and everywhere that they can go. So there's a lot of people that are gonna be displaced, also some that are going to Europe and whatnot. People that are coming, let's just take the, the 100,000, which oftentimes you hear in the news media, they always talk about the interpreters, right? Yes. Yeah, I was with yeah. this interpreter, yes. we were buddies, we were in the, the crack Friendship. together, yeah. and they were shooting, this is my brother, right? You hear a lot of light of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I worked with these guys too. I worked with these guys too. Most of the people I worked with were American citizens, they had top secret security clearances. They had to have that to do the job that I was doing. And some of those guys were working both sides of the fence. No. They were betraying us at the same time that they were working with them. They were doing it for money. They were doing it for any number of reasons. Mm -hmm. What I'm telling you is this is a complex deal. Most of the, the, a lot of the stuff that I did was, was exactly this job, vetting people. I did interviews every day like I said, I did thousands of them, where I would determine what the security risk of this individual that I'm talking to is, and what his badging was going to be, and what he knew, and what his, yeah, all, all kinds of stuff. The vast majority of Afghans 
don't have any kind of paperwork. Like I said, they don't read and write, okay? So they would come in, I said, you, you know, show me some ID. And if they were, if I was lucky, they would pull up this folded up card that's been laminated and it, you'd open it up and it would have some basic information on them. Most of the time, at least 50%, those were, those were forged documents. They weren't real. How do I know that? Because my interpreters, and we had guys that actually that's what they did, is, is figure out the authenticity of documents like that. And, and so they could, they could figure that out. So when we do a vetting process for someone, we have to determine, are they a criminal? You know, is this guy a serial rapist? Has this guy killed anybody? Is this guy a, a jihadist? Is this guy a stand-up person? What's their education? What's their motivation? All kinds of things. I, I would go through and just ask, it would take a long time to ask all the questions that I would ask for. A lot, as I said, almost the vast majority of, of Afghans are not secular people. They're not. They are fundamentalists in their religious outlook, even if they were pro-American, even if they were pro-NATO. Their view, when, when I would ask someone a question, for example, I'd say, you're Muslim. They'd say, yeah, are you Sunni or Shia? And they're, they're Sunni, of course, because the Shia are heretics. What do you do with the Shia? Well, you kill them. Okay? This is the guy that's talking to me. He's going to work on the base. <laughs> Thumbs up. Good. Well, I'm just giving you a, I'm giving you a, 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 a view of how people are. And I say, okay, you are Sunni. Yes, good. Are you religious? Yeah, yeah, I am. Kind of. Do you go? Do you go to mosque? Sometimes. Do you pray? Yes. How often? Five times a day. Usually. Okay. Good. Good man. And you go to mosque. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. So here's the question: Is it okay if if somebody says something bad about the Quran? Is that okay? No. What do you think should happen to that person? They should be punished. What kind of punishment? I don't know, bad punishment. Mm. What if somebody says something bad about Muhammad? The prophet? Yes, the prophet. He should, he should be punished. What kind of punishment? He should die. What if somebody doesn't want to be a Muslim anymore and they want to leave and become a Christian? Death. <coughs> These are for normal people, not, not jihadists. These are just normal Afghans. This is the standard response. I did it, like I said, thousands of times I asked these questions. And this was the standard response. So when you bring 100,000 people in the United States, and let's say they're pro-American, and they worked on the base, and they were interpreters, and they did all kinds of things, you have to beware they're bringing their culture with them. Sure. And their culture may be very, very different than what you are used to. Also, the views about women are very, very different than what you're used to. That's just normal. It's, it's normal throughout most of the, the, uh, the Muslim world, um, not everywhere. But in Afghanistan, Afghanistan and Pakistan are extremely conservative when it comes to male-female relations in most of the country. And so that's why the women wear the burqa. The burqa means tent. They're wearing a tent, and that's what they wear. And they can't show any skin. So even showing your face is a, is, is a no-go. If you go to Kuwait, the girls at least show their face, but not in, not, in, um, not in Afghanistan. So they have a mesh that they see through all the time, and they wear gloves. And it's hot in Afghanistan. I don't know if you know this, but it's hot. It's not as hot as Kuwait, but it's hot. Okay? It, normally, it's over 100 degrees. Normally. Okay? And it goes, we have, you know, it depends. It's a big country, so there's a lot of relatives, so it's different, but it's hot. So that's what girls do. Girls cannot, in, in, traditionally under the Taliban, they could not go out of their homes without a male escort. And usually the male escort is somebody in their family, not a stranger. It would be their, their husband or their, their son, if somebody, their uncle. Okay? They can't leave. Girls can't get educated under the Taliban before. This is what they, they, they can't. They're basically like slaves, when, <laughs> in, in a sense. Okay? In a sense, they are. Many of the people, I, this is another question I would ask. A lot of young men would come to, the, come to the base and they want to work. Generally, we'd pay them maybe $7 a day, which was enough to feed their family. That was good. 
$7 is more than zero, and they could feed the family with that. So they were happy to get that job for eight hours work, okay? Those guys, I ask them, I say, well, what do you want this money for, right? What, what are you here? You come from Miram Shah, which is up in the north, and you're clear down here in Kandahar. Why did you come all the way down here to work? Why? It's because I'm trying to save money. What are you trying to save money for? I want to get married. How old are you? I don't know. When were you born? Uh, I was born in, in, the, in the spring. What day? January 1st. <laughs> they don't know. They don't know. So they all say January 1st. That's their birthday, because they don't know. They don't know calendars, they don't know anything like that. So, okay, so you're here, you're how old? I don't know, you're, you, and so I guess, 22, maybe. So here's this guy, now, what do you want? I, I want to get married. Why do you need money to get married? Because I have to get a wife. Right, why do you need money to get married? I have to get a wife, I have to, I have to pay someone. Oh, how much do you have to pay? Mm, I don't know, one lakh, two lakh, which is like 100,000, 200,000. Uh, rupees okay so they got to buy a wife they have to buy a wife you have you have to go to some gentleman who has a daughter and you negotiate for her and you you pay if the price isn't enough you, she's not coming if it's there then you, you got a wife that's the way it works that's the way it works in Afghanistan it works in Pakistan that's where it works unless you got a cousin a lot of times they marry their cousins because the cousins are cheap or free <laughs> cheaper free. Mm -hmm. They're either cheap, they're cheaper, or they're free. Okay? So it's very, very common to marry your first cousin. Very, very common. In in both Pakistan and in Afghanistan and in much of the Muslim world in general. But more so in those countries. So hey, Bart, Bart we have some chats culture. here. Yeah, yeah. Landon asked the question. Mm. China. They've already signaled pretty heavily that they are interested in helping Afghan rebuild. Yeah, they have an interest in the minerals. Yes, I was just wondering what you were thinking of flags or phase lines of how China would actually get involved and what that means long term. So China is definitely interested in exploiting the mineral resources and the resources in general, uh, the natural resources of the world. They're all over Africa. They are trying to make their Belt and Roads initiative all over Asia. They're trying to connect. They're trying to exert influence. They're building all over the place. Roads and bridges and infrastructure. And usually, though, when they do that, they bring in Chinese workers to build it. They don't hire locals, which is a source of frustration in the local countries. Because they come in, they get hired to do something, and they bring their own people. And who's, who's benefiting from that? The politicians, not the local people, except for ancillary stuff like eating at a restaurant or something like that. So if the Chinese were going to come in, first of all, they would have to make some kind of negotiation with the Taliban. They would have to designate what they're going to do, and then they would have to get a security arrangement where the Taliban would, would guarantee security for a mine, for example. They would probably bring in their own miners, their own people. They would set up a camp which would be very similar to a military base. And then they would try to extract the wealth and they would pay the Taliban for that. That's a very precarious situation. I would be hesitant to do that if I were the Chinese, but they might do that. Yes, sir? It's kind of off topic, but what are your thoughts on the Taliban's offer of a general amnesty? I mean, have they really changed versus the previous Taliban, as we see with ISIS-K being thinking they're too moderate? So this is a, this is a question that, yeah, it, it's hard to know. You, you, can, you can, the people that are in the Taliban all have been, their leadership has been decimated. We have killed their leadership methodically over the 20 years. Just whack them, okay? Except for the guys that have been hiding in, in Pakistan, which is the senior leadership now, or the ones that we capture. Taliban recruits are brought in all the time, and there's a massive number that come from Pakistan. So the Pashtun peoples um, live right along the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan, and there's roughly, I don't know, there's at least three, four, maybe five million in Pakistan and there's another 20 million in Afghanistan. So these are the main fighters. 
that, that we've been confronting. Not the Farsi-speaking people, primarily, mostly the Pashtun people. They, yeah, they're very tribal, they're very clan-based, and so there's lots of different kinds. The Taliban, we say the Taliban. Actually, there's hundreds of Taliban. There's little groups all over the place, and they all have allegiance to somebody. And then there's the big leader in Kabul. Theoretically, he has control over all of them, but not actually. So they can splinter, and they do splinter. And sometimes a Taliban guy might also be an Al-Qaeda guy. And he might then dump Al-Qaeda and become an ISIS guy, they, or a Haqqani guy. They all mix and match, and they go back and forth, and they try to get money, and they try to work all, all the little gigs that they can, and yeah. So it's complex, it's difficult. Will they, will they be moderate? Maybe. They, they are requesting that the United States stay, that we have an embassy there. They, will, they know that the UN provides money to poor countries. They want that money. They also know that the United States has frozen the accounts of, of, of the Afghan government. They would like to get that money. They would like to have trade. Afghanistan is a landlocked country. It can't trade with the world unless it goes through somebody else, mostly Pakistan. They have no port. So what are they going to do? The winter's coming, and that's when everybody dies. <laughs> so there's no food coming over the border from, from anybody. The Americans have taken up their stuff. They're going home. Now we've got to govern the country. What do we do? So the rosy scenario is, and what uh, President Biden is probably is pushing, is that we have these guys. We know what they need, and we're going to push them. And if they don't do what we say, we're going to cut them off. Okay? Previously, when the Taliban ruled the country, they didn't care. They let people die. And, in fact, they had public executions all the time. <laughs> so they, they didn't care. And they did what they wanted. And they had their opium trade. Uh, n about 90% of the world's opium comes out of Afghanistan. <laughs> Most of it goes to Europe. It's a multi-billion dollar a year gig. It's not a great deal of money, but it's enough. It's enough. And they get a lot of money from the Gulf states. There's lots of Arabs that are rich, and they come to things like this, and they have some Taliban guy stand up like me, and he says, hey, brothers, I'm out fighting the fight. I'm doing the jihad. Kick it in. And they do. And they give them money, and then they go home. There's all kinds of connections like that. Tons of connections with Doha and with, with uh, Dubai and with the Arab Emirates in general and Saudi Arabia and all the sheiks. They all kick in money. Are you indirectly asking for money tonight? <laughs> well, that was, that was at the end. That's when I do my dance. <laughs> no. But that's, that's exactly what happens. So they can get money through that. And they do extortion, and they do uh, kidnappings, and they do all kinds of... They're, they're basically like a, a, a mafia. Aren't they like sex trading to stuff, too? They do anything that you can think of. Yeah. Anything that you can think of is going on. And that's, that's what happened. So the, the rosy deal is that we have leverage because of money and all this kind of stuff. That's probably true to a certain extent. But does it mean they're going to abandon who they are? I would doubt it. Because they've spent 20 years <laughs> being who they are. They, are. they believe in Islam. They believe they're going to heaven when they, if they die in jihad. They believe that stuff. <clears throat> as debauched as they are, it's like deathbed confession, and you're going right to heaven, right? So if you die in jihad, if you die for the faith, you're going to heaven no matter what you did in life. So they, they believe that. They believe it with fervor. And are they going to just say, you know, the Americans are going to buy me? No, Allah will, will I'll have my, my paradise in the next life. That's what they would tell me. You guys, you Americans, you have paradise now. We have it in the next life. You're going to be in hell. That's what they tell me so many times. Yeah, All right. So is that? Oh, go ahead, Linda. So is that how they get people to be the bombers? The suicide bombers? Yeah. Suicide bombing is a specialty gig. So th there are people that are <laughs> like true believers that will, you know, put on a, a vest and go kill themselves. There are people like that. <laughs> That's but, right. but the majority of people, or a lot of people, that are suicide bombers are are people who have been groomed 
for that. They've been brainwashed for it. There were camps that I was investigating when I was there that were, that were getting orphans, retarded girls, things like that, and they would tell them, here, put this on, walk into the marketplace, and somebody else has got a radio, and he goes, click, boom. Oh, That's how it often works, as opposed to somebody who knows what they're doing, and they're walking in, and they're going to go click, and they know they're going to die. Some people do that. There are people like that, but a lot of them a are other folks. What's that? Don't you get a virgin when you do that? 72. <laughs> That's not really a Quranic thing, just, oh. to, just so you know. It's kind of a myth. That's oh. something that is alluded to in a hadith. I don't know if you know what the hadiths are, but they're the sayings of the prophet. They're not scripture. They are, it's like, I don't know, for a Mormon audience, uh, somebody spoke to Joseph Smith and he wrote down in his journal. And then somebody reads that and they go, look at what Joseph Smith said. And then everybody learns about it and they, they take that as scripture. Okay. That, that's a hadith. Okay. So it's, a, it's called the sayings of the prophet. So there are tens of thousands of sayings of the prophet. And when one of them is 72 virgins when you die. But the Quran does talk about, you know, doughy-eyed cherubs and stuff like that. So there's a, a kind of a sexual illusion to the afterlife. It's supposed to be a, a sensual delight. They talk about wine, which is forbidden in Islam, but not in paradise. Okay? There's all kinds of stuff like that. So, all the wine you want. All the wine you want and the doughy eyed, whatever, cherubs. So, that's, that's the way that is. Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. ISIS. So, ISIS, as you know, came out in Iraq, and now um, these guys have largely been decimated. They're still about, but not even close to what they were. This just gives you some basic information when they were at their height before they were they were crushed in Syria and Iraq. ISIS was brutal, as brutal as the Taliban. And ISIS and the Taliban are at odds. No, ISIS K, which is the next slide, I believe, is is at odds with with the Taliban. Depending. I'm sorry? Of, they let them out of prison, so they can't be too much at odds. Who, the ISIS-K? Yeah, the Taliban, and they let them out of prison. ISIS-K people, so the, as I said, there's a lot of mixing and matching. So some ex-Taliban became ISIS-K. And because they did that, they're the enemy. You see? It's like, um, uh, I went to Davis High, but now I hate Davis High, and I love Leighton. <laughs> Right? That, so now you're the enemy. That's stupid. Is that simply stupid? Kind of. But it, there, there were people that thought that the Taliban was not doing well, and so groups of them split off, and they formed their own group, and they associated with ISIS, which had established a caliphate, a government, in the traditional sense, in Syria and <laughs> Iraq, and they had legitimacy and power, and they were growing, and they wanted to be associated with those guys. And so they joined. But then the caliphate got wiped out. And now we have this, this new ISIS K. K is uh, Khorasan, which is another name for Afghanistan. And so these guys want to establish their own caliphate in Afghanistan and replace the Taliban. Okay. So that's why they're fighting. They're, they're another group that wants to take power. But they're small relative to the Taliban. They don't have a great deal of power. So that's why they, they're, you know, doing the, the terrorist attack that he's killed the 13 guys. Okay. Taliban didn't want that, supposedly, and they, they blew it up anyway. I mean, Taliban looked bad. I, you may, all the things that were said about the Pashtun people, Pashtun people are honor-driven people. So they have this thing called the Pashtun Wali, which means that you are obligated to give hospitality if somebody asks for it, and you grant it, you fight and die to preserve hospitality. So you may have seen the, uh, the Wahlberg film about the spec op guys, lone survivor. That's a real deal, that actually happened, right? He's the only guy left on his, his team. He gets wounded, he goes to a Pashtun village, and basically they impose Pashtun Wali, and the whole village protects him against the Taliban. Hundreds of people fighting to save this one guy, and it's because this is very honor-bound society. So when the Taliban says, we're gonna protect you, they take that seriously. So I would guess when they made that deal with the Americans, they're gonna, okay, you guys can have the airport and we're gonna zone it off. 
I, I would guess that they took that seriously and they did not want the bombing to happen. This is just my opinion. I could be wrong because as I said, when I told you guys, Afghans lie like we breathe. <laughs> they do. <laughs> they, they really do. I, I, the reason I say that is because I had so many interrogations with people. And previous to an interrogation, very often I would polygraph people. So we had FBI polygraphers with us, and we would send them in, and I would poly these guys. And sometimes they would pass, and sometimes they would fail. That's, I would polygraph the same guy three and four times, and 50-50, roll the dice. Yeah. Yeah. So they are really good at lying. And there's another factor, it's kind of ancillary, but you may find it interesting. I don't know if I talked to you. Are you familiar with the idea of a guilt culture and a shame culture? Have you ever heard that idea? We come from a guilt culture. So you do something bad, you do something that violates your moral code, you feel bad about it, it festers in you, you may or may not do something about it, but it's there. I shouldn't have done that, right? That's a guilt culture. A shame culture is I've done something bad. If nobody ever finds out about it, I didn't do anything bad. That means the only way that you come to consequence is if your, your clan, your people, find out what you did and then you get publicly shamed. And that's when the, it hits the road. That's so what I'm saying. I'm, I'm sorry? So it's an external. It is, pretty much. And so you can have a guy in a shame culture, you can have, for example, I would have a guy who we had photos and he was digging in the road and he had an IED and he was gonna plant the IED in the road and we've got the proof and here he is and you can see his face and I'd say, this is you, right? That's not me. Wait a minute, look at that, look at that face. That is you. It's not me, it's not me. I'm looking at the picture, that's you. That's not me. Okay, so as long as you deny, right? And there's nobody, that's going to say, that is you, right? That's your, I don't know, your mother, your father, your tribal chief, who's gonna go, dang it, that's you. Tell them it's you. Oh, okay, it's me, right? Who am I? I'm just, I'm just a coffer, you know? I'm, I'm just an unbeliever, so. No, that's not me. And he may really believe it in a sense. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a psychological game. It's a thing where you can trick your brain into believing something that is factually false, and it becomes true in your mind. You see what I'm saying? It's weird. Anyway, that's a shame culture. So that's how these things operate. So anyway, Pashtun Wali, shame, maybe. Well, I have a Tangents. question. Yes, ma'am. I'm going back to the basics again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, OK, so why did bin Laden, why did they come and bought, bomb us originally? What did we do to them to call ah, them? Yeah, why did Al Qaeda do that in the yeah. first place? Al Qaeda declared war in the United States during the Clinton administration. I remember when it happened, and nobody cared because nobody knew who Al Qaeda was, and nobody knew who Osama bin Laden was, and so what? There's just some weird Arab. He's a Saudi, right? He's a Saudi mm -hmm. of Yemeni ethnicity who made this deal, and suddenly, yeah. And then things started happening. They blew up the coal. I don't know if you remember the ship, the coal. Oh, Al Qaeda did that. Mm -hmm. There was the blind shake incident where they tried to blow up the two towers earlier and it failed, right? You remember that guy? He kind of looked like a Santa Claus with the red hat. The, Egyptian. Yeah, that, that bombing of the basement of the. That was, that was the basement. That was that one. Yeah. That, that was it. That was it. Yeah. And it failed, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, things started getting serious. The reason that, that Osama bin Laden did that, Saudi Arabia is viewed in Islam as holy ground. The entire kingdom, it's holy. Okay, it's like, I don't know, the temple. It's holy ground, mm -hmm. the entire country. Foreigners cannot be in there. They cannot be in there. If you go as a, you cannot just be a tourist in Saudi Arabia, I don't know if you know this, but they don't issue like just tourist visas. That's why nobody goes to, Saudi Arabia, there's all kinds of cool things in Saudi Arabia, but you, you're never going to see them because they don't issue tourist visas. The only people who go there are technicians. 
And the technicians that go there to keep the oil pumping, because the Saudis also don't know how to take care of their stuff. Their whole system, four million barrels a day, would collapse if all the Westerners left. It's the Westerners that keep that stuff going. The Saudis don't know how to do it. Okay, that's just the truth. <laughs> yeah, so all of those people, those expats living in Saudi Arabia, they live in camps. They live in, in contained areas made for them, separated from the holy people. Who are the holy people? They're the Saudis. So you have these groups, right? When Saddam Hussein attacked Kuwait, Saddam Hussein wanted to attack Saudi Arabia. I don't know if you knew this, but he had plans to do that. We've, we've seen that. Okay? He was going to go into the Saudi Arabia. And if he's smart, he should have done that. He'd still be in control today, probably, if he did. When he went into, into Kuwait, he stopped. And he consolidated. And that's when we sent in, took us six months to get 600,000 guys into Kuwait for the first Gulf War. Right? So, do, where did our guys go? Some of them were based in well, a lot of them were based in Arabia. That's holy ground. And you have all these non-believing, pagan-worshipping Christians sitting in holy ground. That does not fly. And so Osama bin Laden told the Saudi government, get them out and say, who are you to tell us? I'm the king. I make the decisions. The bin Ladens, you know, are nobody. Out. And they expelled him from the kingdom. And he became a worldwide terrorist. We went to Afghanistan to kill him, to disrupt Al Qaeda, his leadership. Okay. Yeah, right? that, that was the group that attacked us on 9/11, mm -hmm. and also to to uh, punish the Taliban, kick them out, and to to keep the country from being a terrorist safe haven. Okay, because. That's what they did. They closed their country. They let in all these terrorists, Al-Qaeda. They said, you can train here. You can set up bases here, and you're safe. And they did that. And with that training and with that, that logistical base, they were able to launch their attacks against New York. Okay. So we went in there to deny them that space and to kill their leadership. And that's why we got there. That's why we and went in the we first place. And we were there place. for these 20 and years. And we stayed there for 20 years. So this is the, the thing. Why did we stay there for 20 years? We stayed there for 20 years not to nation build. This is, a lot, this is just not true. Wherever the Americans go, we nation build. We did it in Italy. We did it in Germany. We did it in, you know, that's what we do. We spread democracy and we spread our culture. This is what we do. But, but we were not in Afghanistan or Iraq to nation build. We do that as a side gig. The main reason that we're there is to prevent the bad guys from using this land to kill us. And part, although although we lost 5,000 people yes. over the last 20 years, soldiers, yes. right? Yes. Think about, I mean, we don't know because there's no way of knowing how many had, how many would have died had nothing been done there and they just continue to get bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger and then they launch attacks on Americans, right? Which is where we're at now. Which would have been much greater than the 5,000 soldiers we lost. So it's, it's, it's speculative, right? What, what could have happened. But we know that, that whenever there are, take, the, take the, uh, the mafia, for example. The mafia came to New York because Mussolini kicked them out of Italy, right? So they come to New York, they set up shop, and they go to town. The mafia weren't expelled, weren't ended until Giuliani did it in the 80s. So for that entire time, they just grew and grew and grew. They got bigger and bigger. They started taking over the garbage industry. They took over the construction industry. They took over all kinds of things. So that's a kind of a, the terrorist mentality is very similar to a mafia mentality, is what I mean. It's very criminally oriented in the way that they get money, in the way that they exploit people, in all kinds of things. And so if you leave it unchecked, it grows. It grows. And if, you're, if your purpose, if your raison d'etre is to, it's to kill Westerners, to kill people who don't believe, non-believers, and to impose a Muslim caliphate all over the world, especially against the Jews in the United States, the big Satan and the little Satan, you're gonna, and, and you have success, 
Whenever you have success, that means God wants it to happen because the Muslims believe that God controls everything. God makes things happen. So when, when Afghanistan fell, God made that happen, which means we're on the right side. You understand what I'm saying? So, so success breeds more of the same, especially in, in this, this fatalistic mentality, and defeat has a much more debilitating effect. Is God Israel, is not on our side. Is Israel the little Satan, or are we the little Satan? No, it's was the little Satan. We're, We're the, the big, big Satan. We're the big Satan. Yeah. 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 Yesterday. Did they? Is that, uh, <laughs> yeah. is that why they're mad? Why they? I mean, I don't understand. I knew we had to come out because we were spending money, mm -hmm. and they wanted to get us out of there. Mm. So why did it turn into be such a mess? Why it turned into such a mess? So that's a good question. That's a good. That's a good question. So I've got another slide. I'll, we'll explore that. Hit, hit this one. This was. This is ancient Khorasan. This is what Isis K wants to establish. Okay. Let's skip this Doha agreement. We miss that. Could we have stayed? Okay. So this is going to your question. Yes. Could we have stayed in Afghanistan? Yes, we could have. How do we know that? Well, we're still in England. We're still in Germany. We're still in South Korea. We're still in the Philippines. Philippines is the longest, right? That was our colony, 1898, Spanish-American War. We've been there since then. That was a brutal war, by the way. We were really brutal in the Philippines. Anyway, we could have stayed. We could have stayed there. <coughs> Minimal cost. To maintain less than 10,000 soldiers would have cost, I don't know, maybe $40 billion a year. That's a lot of money. But we have a about a $4 trillion budget per annum. That's, that's the U.S. budget, about $4 trillion. We borrow about $1 trillion of that, but that's our budget. And this year, it's about a $10 trillion budget because we're pumping in tons, right? Mm -hmm. But our normal budget is right around $4 trillion a year, and maybe $40 billion of that, which is less than 1%, would have been to stay in Afghanistan. Okay? Minimal troop losses. We lost one soldier in the last 18 months. If we were in war or into hostilities with the Taliban, which is what President Biden says would have happened. Since 2014, we have been in hostilities with the Taliban, and our total losses, I showed you that previously, was less than 20 guys. Most of the people who lost were, were due to accident, not hostile fire. But we kept our place safe and kept that reason safe. No, that, that's that. Why, if we say what would have been done, right? It prevents the Taliban or Al Qaeda, etc., mm -hmm. Haqqani Network, other mm -hmm. terrorist groups from consolidating in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. That's one reason to stay. This is what it would do. This is what it has done for 20 years. Also, it gives the Afghan government more time to stabilize. The Afghan government is a new government. They're brand new. Okay, so we did 20 years. 20 years is nothing. First 20 years of our republic, we we had you know two different constitutions. We were a mess. <laughs> it took time. So it takes time to grow. The, the longer that you have for a government to stabilize, the more efficient it's going to be, the better it's going to be. Same thing, modernization, more freedom for the people. There is a vast difference up until yesterday in Kabul versus when the Taliban were there. If you were there, you would see beauty shops, you would see cinemas, you would see malls, you would see uh, female entertainers, you would see girls going to school. You would see anything and everything going on on the streets. It was a modernizing country that was becoming more and more secular, less and less radical. The American influence, just being there, we, we pump out our culture. American soldiers are really good at that, <laughs> okay? They just pump out a culture, and that culture is really attractive to young people. It's really, if you go to any American base, anywhere in the world, you'll see lines of girls waiting outside for their soldiers. Yes. Truly, you will. I know. Yeah, you know. That's the way it is. You will see all <laughs> kinds of activity Sorry. going in. Midnight does that. Midnight does that. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So it, it's, this, it's, a, it's a magnet for uh, modern culture, and it's very, very attractive, no matter where you're coming from. 
So the longer that we're there, the more that comes into being. And the more females that you get educated, girls change society. This is just a fact of life because girls run families. Okay? If you have an educated, as a Brigham Young said, you educate a man, you educate an individual, you educate a woman, you educate a family. It's absolutely true. The reason that things are going on today in the world demographically is all because of women. The more educated women get, the fewer children they have. The more educated women get, the more wealth they get. And you have a massive demographic shift because of what happens with women. And it affects everybody. Okay? So when, if, you want, if you want to secularize a society, you educate girls. Because girls, just being able to read and write, suddenly it opens up worlds that are not possible in any other way. And that's what we were doing. We built thousands of schools in Afghanistan. And it wasn't about nation building so much as it's security. It's long-term security measures. This is how you change a society. The problem is the United States is not an empire. A problem, see, I say a problem. It's a problem in that when you're doing foreign policy, you have to think in the long term. And our government is not set up for that. We are set up to be short term, to think right here at the edge of our noses. That's why we elect our Congress every two years. That's why we elect our president every four years. That's why we can only have a president for eight years. That's why the Senate is only for six years. Everything is right here and everything is fighting against each other. The legislature fights the executive, the executive fights the Supreme Court, and it's all meant to put a check on government power. That makes our government very, very inefficient, but it also makes for maximum individual liberty. And that's what our government is created for. It's not created for an empire. But we are the greatest power in the world. So in effect, we have replaced the old empires. The old European empires are dead. And what replaced them? Us. So we have to maintain the status quo. It's our burden. So that means we've got to think beyond our nose. <laughs> this, is the, this is the burden. And it's a problem because the United States is not geared for that. We don't like it. We don't like it at all. We just want to make money and sit home and have barbecues. <laughs> this is what Americans want. They don't want to be out there like the Brits ruling the world. It's against our, our basic DNA. All right, next slide, please. Could we have left better? This is more directly to your question. So yes, we could have left better. Since 2014, I missed my C there, the US, or the US has been withdrawing forces. So I showed you the graph. We went from 100,000 down and when Obama left to under 10,000 in about four years. Boom, boom, boom. That's pretty quick withdrawal. But even with 10,000 guys, Afghanistan was stable. It was stable. The Taliban were there. They controlled zero provinces. They controlled zero um, major towns. None. None, 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 none. And in the last two weeks, they've controlled the entire country. So we have been withdrawing forces for, for all this time. Trump dropped it down to 2,500 from about 8,000, 8,000, down to 25,000, 5,000, and then down to that. We could have bumped it up a little bit if we wanted to. We could have kept it right there. Since, since Mr. Biden came in, he knew that he was going to leave Afghanistan. If you know you're going to leave a country, and it's been a war zone, and you have a hostile enemy in the field, how do you do it? Quick. This is the way you do it. <laughs> you, you have evacuation protocols. First people out are the civilians. You get the civilians out. Okay? That means you call all, you get all those people while there's you have security and you say, you're out of here tomorrow. You're out of here. You don't give them a choice. You're out. The military controls Afghanistan, you make them go. Then you got your allies. So we got the Brits, we got the Germans, we got the French, we got all, we got the Kuwaitis, they're all there. Sign out of babe. Thanks for helping us out. Hit the road. Okay? Daily. Then you've got your friendly Afghans or your friendly forces. You're an interpreter for me. I'm going to vouch for you. You're coming with me. I'm going to take you. I'm going to take your family. And we're going to get all your paperwork done. And you're coming out. That's the way you do it. And you make sure everybody knows. And they have their day. They have their paperwork. They have their visas. They have their passports. They have all their stuff. They've been vetted. And those are the guys going out. And then last of all, the troops. 
We did it completely the opposite. And that's why it's the proverbial goat screw. Okay? Because of that. You, that's just the wrong way to do things. You just don't do it that way. And if you do, you're going to have chaos. But that's how they got out. Well, yeah, we, said, we, said, we started withdrawing our people. We gave, okay. and we said, we're leaving. Okay. And they started pulling people out. We abandoned Bagram Air Grace. We abandoned Jalalabad. We abandoned Kandahar. We abandoned Miram Shah. We pulled our military. Then, then they saw things were starting to go bad because the Taliban started occupying those places. Okay. So President Biden <laughs> mobilized the 82nd, 10th Mountain, and he sent them to Kuwait, he sent guys to Qatar. We had, what, 6,000 soldiers surge into the, the Gulf states, and some of those guys ended up uh, in, in, um, in Kabul reinforcing the airport because they had taken out too many guys too quick. So they had to send them back. So they had to send guys back. So we went from 2,500 up to about 5,000. <laughs> Okay. So when you say 10th Mountain, where, where were they? Those guys are out of New York, 10th Mountain okay, Division. that's where we were at. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, and Barb, where are we released to the equipment? 85 billion in equipment came out. Okay, so some of the, we have been withdrawing equipment, contrary to popular belief, we have been withdrawing equipment, but we didn't withdraw all of it. So whenever the United States leaves, we always leave some stuff. We always do. The question is, <laughs> What do you do with that stuff? If you know it's going to be taken over by an enemy, traditionally, you blow it up. You just blow it up. If you can't blow it up through demolitions, then you do airstrikes. That's traditionally what we do. We didn't do that this time, probably because President Biden had a deal with the Taliban to secure Kabul airport and he thought if we do some kind of destruction of this equipment, they're going to get angry and we're going to have a firefight at Kabul Airport and we don't have the ground forces now to defend that terrain and it's going to get really bloody. So he says, you can just have that stuff. That would be my guess. I'm and trying, I'm just guessing. so bad when they got to the airport. And then when they got to the airport, they have, we have tens of thousands of people surging to the airport. Okay, are all those people our friends? I don't know. There's a lot of people who want to get out of Afghanistan for any number of reasons, any reason that you can think of. There are people that, that say, I want a better life. I don't want to be watching the goats. I don't want to be a chicken farmer. I want out and I don't want to live under the Taliban, right? I want out. Does that mean they're good guys? Does that mean they're our friends? No, that just means they want to leave the country. And so those people search the airport and if you can get on an airplane, you're going to Europe, you're going to the United States, you're going to Turkey, you're going somewhere outside of, of Afghanistan, and that is a win. So Bart, Sorry. you talk about them wanting to leave. Mm. I guess what I don't understand is why did the Afghan government, the Afghan military, why did they cave so quickly? Is, is there no desire for self-government? Is there no desire to, I mean, if, if, if they know the Taliban's coming to the village, why don't some of the young men band together and we're going to stop them, we're going to keep control of our village. Why did they cave so easily? So, the, the Afghan army was on, had a paper strength of about 300, 400,000. And when I say a paper strength, I mean just that. There's a lot of names on there. It was padded. So, the Afghans got paid by how many people they had on their list. And so, a lot of the soldiers who were supposedly on their list were just fictitious. They didn't exist. But the commander was pocketing money for private X. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So they, they, that's one reason that you have uh, an overinflated strength of, of a military. Then you have lots of units, you have lots of people who join the military or the local militia. Why did they join? They join because they don't have a job. They need five, six bucks a day, right? So they get, they, they're going to get that money, but are they really trained? What kind of, what's their, what's their motivation? Why are, how many people are willing to die for your country, right? How many? Are you ready to go outside and die right now? Are you ready? Most people are not willing to do that, no matter where, what country you're from. And if you have it, if you don't have the oomph to go out and fight, 
and, and you've got guys who are coming with AK-47s and rocket launchers, and they're in things, and they are going to kill you if you fire at them. Are you going to do it? Most people will not do that. So who will do that? There are some people do. Like I said, I, I mentioned the commandos. About 20,000 in the Afghan army are commandos. They're really good fighters. Oh, thank you. That, I'm good, I'm good. And they're in the Panjshir Valley right now fighting against the Taliban. So some people are doing that. But you're right, the larger uh, structure of the Afghan army simply evaporated. And they evaporated, I would argue, because the United States publicly said, we are leaving, we're taking all our contractors with us, you're not gonna have artillery support, you're not gonna have tactical air support, and you're on your own. And that just destroyed morale, and everybody said, we're done. How are we gonna fight these guys? Because the Taliban are not just the Taliban. The Taliban come from Pakistan. They were created by the ISI, which is the equivalent of the FBI, it's the internal security forces of Pakistan. They created the Taliban. They created it during the, the Afghan Civil War after the Russians left. They created them, they funded them, they, they provided logistics for them, and that's where a lot of their recruits come from. So they have a source of supply, they have a source of new troops, they have a support area, and that's where, who, who was killed in Pakistan? Osama bin Laden was killed in Pakistan, just down the road from their West Point, their military academy, okay? So, Pakistan is their sanctuary, and they have a, a support they can always go back to. No matter how many times we've decimated the, Paki, the Taliban, they can always retreat into Pakistan, and they can regroup. And they can increase their numbers, they can retrain, they get more stuff, and they come back in. And they did that every year. So, with us leaving, who's going to do that for the Afghan army? Nobody. We're on our own. And for the last 20 years, Every time we've gone out on a patrol, we've got the American, we've had some American with us. We've had American trainers with us. We have the guy that's gonna call in tactical air support. We have the guy who's gonna call in artillery strikes. Those are the guys with us. And when the stuff got bad, <laughs> he did that. That person did that, saved my life, and I went home to my wife, or I went home every day. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So th that's that's my opinion, I would guess. But yeah. I've also heard that the uh, Taliban were bribing some of the Afghan military leaders to just walk away, and once they did, all their subordinates lost all hope of... I'm, I'm sure that happened. I'm sure that happened. There's, there's a lot of corruption in Afghanistan, like tons of corruption. It's endemic in the society. They don't even view it as corruption. It's just normal business. That's how business works. Connections. You pay me, I pay you, you do something for me, I do something for you. That's just normal business. It's not about law. So I'm sure that's correct. I have another question. Ma'am. And this may be not to talk about. Mm. But why all of a sudden, okay, everybody's mm. out. Yeah. And and there's this big mess now. Yes. That we left people. Yes. So is it our fault or I mean to me as a person watching TV yeah. and hearing all this, I'm yeah. thinking Biden just screwed us all up and mm. you know, everybody yeah. hates the military guy and blah right. blah blah. Right. And you know, um, But didn't he just explain to us we're dual citizenships? At, Everybody that wanted to get out, wanted, okay, so right? I'm just, just said? I have not seen any statistics on this. I'm just, I'm just pontificating. I'm oh. pining. I haven't seen it for sure. But my experience is, there's a lot of Afghans. Like I said, all my interpreters were Afghan natives who had dual citizenship. They were American citizens, but they were also Afghans. All of them had family in Afghanistan or yeah. Pakistan. So they wanted to stay, maybe. So if your family. You're out, you're from, your family's from Idaho, okay? Idaho is being invaded by Montana. And your mom and your cousins are up there in Preston. <laughs> and you're up there with them. You can cross the Bear River into Utah, or you can stay with your family. What are you going to do? A lot of people say, I'm going to stay with my family. Yeah. I'm not going to leave my family. So I would guess that many of the people that are being called Americans, they are Americans, they have a, a, a passport that says they're American, but I would guess that a lot of them are <coughs> native Afghans and that a lot of them have 
family ties, interests in Afghanistan, and it's not a simple decision for them to just leave. Yeah. Also, there are people that are probably trapped, yeah. and they I've can't get out. Yeah. And they can't get out. They want to get out, and they're barred, and they just can't. Yeah. It's not an easy thing if you are wherever, and you want to get to this one place that is allowing, and there's at, there's Taliban soldiers all over, and inside that ring there's American soldiers, and nobody's letting you through unless you can show your whatever. You can see how problematic that is, right? And you go up and you say, I'm an American, I'm an American. No, you're not. And now I'm an American. See what I'm saying? I take your passport, now I got it. I, I'm not, <laughs> that's just the game. I'm just saying it's very easy to have a lot of problems trying to get out of the country. To really blame a president, I mean, I'm not saying I'm a Republican or a mm -hmm. Democrat, but people are blaming him for leaving all these Americans behind. I think we need to open our eyes a little bit and say, well, let's, let's. So the, the thing is, <laughs> the, the, the politics no. of this are complex. Yeah. But if you're the president and you are determined, you're the president of the United States, you just got elected seven months later, you're thinking, I want to get out of here, and your advisors are telling you, you know, September 11th, if we celebrated getting out of Afghanistan, our poll numbers are going to tell us. That's a really good idea. Most of the American people want out of Iraq and Afghanistan. If you do it, wouldn't that be a great time, Madam President, to celebrate your, you know, your, your big foreign policy thing? You say, yeah, that might be a good thing. I think we should get out. I often, I've never been in favor of being over there in the first place. Let's pull it. Okay, so if you want to pull it, this is how you do it. But he went right to but military. If you, but if you start pulling out all your, all your guns first, you can't secure <laughs> all of these other people. Yeah. Right? So if you, want, if you want to get all these people out, or at least give them a viable chance to get out, okay. you have to have more than one exit route. If that's the only door out, and we yell fire, even with this small group here, it's going to be a, a cluster, right? And you don't give up bombs. Yeah, and, and it's like you up, said. You don't give up modern air base. Right, because uh, you said Afghanistan's the size of Texas. Imagine if they had to evacuate that many people, and no matter where you're at in Texas, the only place is you you gotta Dallas, Fort Worth. You got to get to Dallas. That's it. You can't get to DFW. You go to Austin, it's no good. You get to Houston, it's no good. You got to get to Dallas, and you got to get right on the airport. It's the only way out. So that's, that's a problem. You don't want that scenario if you're actually planning a, an evacuation. You want it to be orderly, and you want to make sure that the people that are getting out are the right people, not just anybody who can elbow their way through, right? Okay. Chaos is never a good <laughs> way to do anything. <laughs> so, so Barry, Barry, yes, sir. Uh, we know that the president left, mm. and the vice president of Afghanistan is up fighting with the... Uh, mm. uh, well, wherever, wherever they're still fighting, mm -hmm. is is the president uh, a scoundrel? Is he a scoundrel? Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's, that's he's, he's an interpretation. Ghani, his name is. Yeah, Ghani. Ghani. Is a scoundrel? Did he just pick up his, his money and run? He did. Or did he, mm -hmm. is he trying to preserve something for later? As far as we know, he took his money and he ran. I haven't heard or read anything that would as associate him with doing any courageous thing or noble thing. But the vice president there fighting, is he the de facto president in exile now? You could say that if somebody would recognize him. Yeah. So uh, up to this point, nobody has recognized uh, that power. But we haven't recognized the Taliban either. We haven't recognized them. So it could go mm -hmm. either way. Yeah. I have another question mm -hmm. about Christians. Yeah. What was the deal? Because I know Glenn Beck is trying to save Christians. A lot of, I feel like a lot of military, ex-military, are mm -hmm. trying to go back in with planes, trying to get people out. Yeah. He went in. He has this Nazarene fund. Yeah. And he got people. He, they had two or three airplanes that took the Christians out. So, if they're all like this, mm. why did the, how did the Christians ever get there? <laughs> There, like I say, there, there's probably 40 million people in Afghanistan, 35 million, 40 million people. Maybe, I don't know, a thousand of them are Christian. So did the Christians get, get along <laughs> there's not with, a lot. with the... There, there's 5,000 Christians. Is there 5,000? 
Did they come out of that same airport that the military was at? Is that where Glenn Beck landed his plane? Yeah. I, I, I would imagine that's the only place to land your yeah. airplane. Okay. So if there are 5,000 Christians, that's a really small number in a population of that size. It's being another religion in Afghanistan is, is a good way to die. Yeah. <laughs> so if you were Christian, the only way you would do that is live in Kabul and be around foreigners. Because if you're outside of Kabul and you are a Christian, you most likely are going to die. They, they take that stuff very seriously. And they killed all their Hindus. Uh, Pakistan used to be a Hindu country. I, the, I told you the first empire, the Mauryans, right? And then there were Buddhists. That's how the, the big Buddhas got built in Bamiyan by the Hazaras, the Mongol people I told you about. So, yeah, they, they killed all those people. When the Muslims came, they just killed them. That's why you have, you ever heard of the Hindu Kush? Yeah. The Hindu Kush, that means where the Hindus are killed. That's what that means, where the Hindus die. <laughs> so that's the Himalayas, right? So that's what the Arabs did when they went when they went in and they conquered India. When they first got there, they found all the pagans, and they, they just started killing them all. Because the Hindu gods, right? You know what they look like, yeah? Vishnu. So they, they, they've got the you know they, they've got the all the various kinds from 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 Ganesh, the elephant god, to yeah Vishnu and and, uh, and all the others. So they they look very pagan, and so they just killed like massive numbers of Hindus. And they did that in Afghanistan too. So what will happen to the people that didn't get in to get to the airplane? And that, I mean, Those people will have to go into hiding and then they will have to try and bribe their way out and or try to get to the border, get to Iran, get to Pakistan, get to one of the, the northern uh, ex-Soviet stands, Turkmenistan, or... Because, like, apparently there's Americans still there that didn't get to the airport. They tried, and they, they were denied. I've heard stories. So yeah. that may be. Like I say, I, I, there's, I don't know who those people are exactly. None of them have been identified. Yes, sir. I was going to say that um, the Taliban has been making assurances that they'll allow people to leave after yesterday, can we believe that? Well, yeah, that's what we'll just have to wait and see. Yes. I mean, are they are they really motivated by those billions of dollars? That... Yeah. So it's a question. Nobody knows. Yeah. Okay, I'm still hung up on this. What thing. part? Okay, so we saw on TV mm. thousands of people leaving the airport. Yeah. And you said there were not that many military there. So who were those people? Were they not civilians and and natives and? So most of the people that you see, that there's the there's the 2,500 or so, it might have been up to yeah. 5,000 okay. American military soldiers guarding Kabul Airport. Yeah. That's the that's the ring of steel, right? Okay. Inside that you have contractors and you have American civilians, like I was in Kandahar. Okay, okay? just people that are over there working. Some th some of those people. Then you have Afghans that have that are um, dual citizenship, and they're trying to get out with their families. And then you have friendly Afghans who have gone through the visa process or are trying to get green cards or something else. They're under the special visa um, deal, like with the interpreters, and they're trying to get out. And then there's the vast majority who are just Afghans and they're rushing the airport trying to get so on a plane. Who were those that we saw on TV getting in those airplanes? Only the military? No, they're all the all the above. Yeah, so you can't say that the military left before everybody else. Okay, so they did. So they what they did is they pulled the military out to twenty five hundred. Most, 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 except for a few. Months ago. Right. And, then, okay. and then months ago, and then over weeks, the Taliban moved in and they got to, you know, okay. took over the whole country. And then the so government, the, the, the our American government military. Said, was Go not brought in. down to zero. It was never brought down to zero. But close. We had, yeah, maybe 2,500 people yeah. there. Okay. okay. And, and before Without we started the, the, the exit, all of Afghanistan was controlled by the central government in terms of provinces and major cities. The countryside was largely controlled by the Taliban. Okay. So we had the Afghan army in the field. We had the Americans concentrated at Bagram Air Force Base in Kandahar. In Jalalabad and also in Kabul. Then so, those are small groups of troops. Okay? So 
in order to, if you're going to evacuate and you have guessed there might be 100,000 people that you want to evacuate, is 2,500 guides enough to do that? Okay. Maybe if you do it in a very orderly process and you start with, dun, 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 <laughs> and the so last guys to get out are the, are the military. Okay. Does that make better oh, sense? Yes, thank you. That part really bothered me. So thank yes, you. Yeah. Just, I know you don't want to say your opinion, but I feel like we're back at square one. Are we? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What, what is the, and I, I don't know where we. Do you think we'll have to go back to Afghanistan? So that has happened the first time with the Mujahideen, right? When they were fighting the Russians, the Soviet Union. We didn't have soldiers on the ground, but we were supplying them with weapons and training and all that kind of stuff. And that gave a little bit of impetus for the Russians or the Soviets to leave, right? And then as soon as the Russians were gone in 89, we cut ties and we left. And immediately Afghanistan went into civil war and they had a civil war that lasted 10 years. And at the end of that 10 years, the Taliban came in and they were the strongest dog on the block and they took over. And then, that set up the Al Qaeda situation and New York, and then we got were compelled to go back in there. So right now, yeah, we're basically back to the Taliban in control, which is one of the reasons we went there in the first place. And we have to ask ourselves, now what? What what's what's going to happen? Are we what are we willing to do? What are we not willing to do? So we'll probably just repeat, right? The vacuum will suck up the ISIS, they'll build cells, they'll do training camps, they'll figure out how to declare another jihad against America, some kind of terrorist action will occur, and then we'll have to go back. There are all kinds of possibilities. Could you hit that on the next slide? Could you hit that? I need to see what we got. Refugees, I talked about this a little bit, just so you know, not to cut off that discussion, but just so you know. This is kind of where we're going, um, what we can expect. Millions of people, if they come, we talked about this, cultural problems, religious issues, male-female issues. Anybody who comes to this country from Afghanistan, except for a very small group, are going to have a lot of cultural adjustments. It is really, really, it's like going to Mars. It'll be very, very difficult for them. It'll be difficult for us. Next slide, please. Yes, sir. Oh. The one glimmer of hope that mm. I have, mm. and maybe it's naive because of, I'm guessing what you're about to talk about, is that for the last 20 years, at least a, a generation yeah. of Afghans has right. seen what could be. No, it's true. Yeah. And I'm hoping that they will maybe make the next generation of leaders and uh, stand up to the Taliban as much as they can, or? It's possible. I don't know. So the, the, the resistance movement that's happening in Panjshir right now, that can be crushed or it can be fortified. So if you're President Biden, you can make that decision. You say, do we want to supply these guys? Do we want to get the CIA in there and the SAF? Do we want to provide tactical air with them? Do we want to have drones uh, help them? Do we want to give them weapons and, and fund them and keep their rebellion alive, or we're going to let it get crushed. If we decide to let it get crushed, the Taliban are the only game in town, and nobody's going to be able to kick them out outside of, most likely, outside of an external force. If we fuel that, and we decide we want to, we're back there again, and we're still in the fight. And are we sick of it or not? I mean, it's a decision that has to be made. This is just about the women, child marriages, very common in Afghanistan, you know. As soon as girls have their cycle, they're marriageable, sometimes before that as well. You should have you know, the tent everywhere. Uh, yeah, we talked about this already. Next one. Almost done. Likely consequences. Yeah, so we were talking about this. This is, I wrote this before, just the last few days, so you can see some of these things have happened, some not. Afghanistan could become a global center for jihad. There's a new vigor to terrorism. We haven't heard anything about terror really for quite a while, right? Yeah. It's been pretty quiet. Yeah. I would guess that's going to change. I would guess. You will start seeing copycat things. You'll, you'll see lone wolf guys blowing stuff up. I, I would think you'll be missing some more. <coughs> we talked about the Chinese already a little bit. And U.S. enemies will be emboldened everywhere. So this is a big secondary consequence of this kind of action. Everybody who is a 
opponent to the United States or a threat to the United States will be emboldened by this. The United States looks weak, and it's going to make Iran act up. They're already acting up. It's going to make China act up. It's going to make the Russians act up. Everybody who is against us is going to be emboldened by this, and they're going to do things. They're going to push a button they might have hesitated to push before. North I would Korea. guess. North Korea maybe as well. Any, anybody, because the United States looks weak. And when you look weak, it's just like a bully, right? Bullies pick on the weak. So if you look weak, you're going to get bullied. If we hadn't have started this, mm. bringing them back, mm. when, is that going to make us look like we're bad? Yeah, and it makes us look really yeah it's gonna If we hadn't like, done that. It's going to be a, a big vacuum, isn't it? Yeah, so we've, we've all, the vacuum's already been filled. Okay. It's been filled very quickly. The Taliban took over like yeah. in 10 days, right? Boom. So we went from a very relatively stable country, as I said, with, there's been one American death in 18 months. Prior to that, maybe two in the last year, and since 2014, only a handful. And now, so now everything is, NFL, is, like, is... Okay, Trump wanted to do it, Biden's doing yeah. it, and all this. If they had not have done it and just tried to support them, mm and help build their nation and right. stuff, would we be, be in this problem in the Well, we, we've been doing that for the last 20 years, and we have had this, as I, I did in the other slides, there's the idea of the endless war. This is what people have said. Mm -hmm. And I argued that we really haven't had an endless war, that we've had something that's not war. It's been more like kind of just uh, occupation. It's been very, very, relatively quiet. Nobody's going out on patrol in Afghanistan for the last four years. Nobody's kicking in doors and shooting people. Nobody's doing any of that stuff. It's just not going on. Um, when I left, interrogation stopped like the next year. We, we just stopped doing it. We stopped all the offensive stuff that we were doing. Every once in a while a drone will hit, like a leader or something like that, but we pretty well stopped offensive operations and we just hunkered down on our bases we sent logistical people and trainers to bolster the, the Afghans and Iraq. Same thing's going that on there. And we provide tactical air support and artillery support. And that, that's about it. And with that, it's enough to keep those governments in power and to provide a, a, lot, a, a level of stability which allows their societies to progress. And it's a decision that you have to make at a political level. Is that what we want to do or do we not want to do that? Would you hit the next slide for me, please? This, yes. So we get these 100,000 people out and fly them out and dump them someplace. <laughs> where, where are we dumping them? What are they doing? How are they eating? Where are they staying? So a lot of those people are in Germany right now. They've, in, in some of the big bases, they've created bases for tens of thousands. Some of them are starting to trickle in the United States. Certain states have said we'll take X number of people, whatever. So eventually, mm -hmm. those people are coming to the United States, and it may be a lot more than 100,000. Who's feeding them? They will come in just like refugees, and uh, just like the guys on the south border that are coming over. <coughs> it'll it'll be very similar to that. We Except in Utah today. Yeah, yeah. 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 Some are people. They will come in. The, the the government, the state government, will decide. Like when the when the refugees came from Katrina, right? We had a lot of guys from New Orleans. They came down and they stayed at Camp Williams. We had uh, like, I don't know, 1,500 uh, people from New Orleans that just stayed there. A lot of times they go to military bases because we have a lot of land there. We can set up massive tent cities <coughs> and then you just stick them there until you get them with job training or housing or you know partnerships or whatever and then they, you move them out into society. By the way, this other border immigration though has been a million already this year. So this is one tenth of that. Yeah, it's smaller. Good question. I'm wondering, will we recognize, will the women still have to wear their tents all over? Sure. So when you, when, if you come to the because United States, there, obviously we don't require that at all, right? But if you are in a traditional Afghan family, you may feel pressure to continue that at least for a time, or even a desire to. Is that a religion, though? Yeah. I mean, you don't have to. There's a, there's vast difference in the Muslim world about what they call it's called covering. So how you cover. So if you go to Morocco, for example, uh, you will see everything from a, a, a burqa to girls in thong bikinis on the beach. Okay, 
there, there's a vast difference. Same thing in Dubai. You, 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 yeah, you, these are very... I mean, how many people look at LDS women and say, why are you dressed so oppressively? Yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah. Nice. Tunisia is like that. Turkey is, is a little bit like that. It's, it, these are fairly secular Arab societies that permit a lot of difference. But you go to other places, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, lots of other um, Muslim-majority countries in Africa, and they, the, the women are <coughs> restricted in very strong ways. So it depends. It depends on the nation. It depends on your culture. If you go to Indonesia, they look very different than they do in... Indonesia is the number one um, Muslim country in terms of numbers. Did you know that? Indonesia is... Well, there's well, 200 million people. Religion, in like our garments, but that's not the case. Well, it's, it, it is in the Quran. Women are told to cover. And the covering that is, the language that is used in the Quran is to, it's very, what, well, bejeweled language. It's like, cover your, your, your charms. So that's modest. <laughs> so the idea of that, originally, oh, I don't know if you want to hear the story. Muhammad had a wife, her name was Aisha, was her fa his favorite wife, he had many wives, okay? Aisha was his favorite. He married her when she was six, he had sex with her when she was nine, she became his number one wife. He loved her. He loved her very much. Okay, and she had power. She was like a, she was a powerful woman because she was Muhammad's number one wife. He loved her a lot. Anyway, in the early days, before all this kind of stuff came out, girls dressed provocatively. Okay, in that culture. And one day, one of one of uh, Muhammad's generals came in, and he saw Aisha in a state that was of semi-undress. And Muhammad heard about it, and he went, and he was upset, and he prayed to God, and he said, what do I do about this? And God said, basically out of revelation, and he said, your women should not be dressed like this. They need to cover their charms, basically. I, I, I'm butchering the exact surah, <laughs> but that's basically it. And what it basically meant is, is the breast area and something. But Muslims have said over the centuries, the more you cover, the less likely you are to be tempting to men. And men are weak. They can't control themselves. And we got to cover. And so they start covering more and more and more and more and more. And then it's all covered. And that's how it started. So there you go. All right. Da, da, da. We talked about some of this stuff. Next one, please. American Islam. Okay, so this is something that you, you should think about. Every American should think about this. I have two slides here. American isolationism versus engagement. The United States was back. We got independence in 1783. Got our constitution in 1787. And George Washington was our first president, and one of his farewell address, which almost all of you have heard, was avoid entangling alliances. Right? And the United States became an isolationist power. We were protected by our two oceans. We had the Monroe Doctrine, told the Europeans to stay out of the Americas, which we didn't really have the power to enforce, but we said it anyway. Right? And we created this idea of, we just started concentrating on ourselves. And we did that for a long time, until the Spanish-American War, 1898. Theodore Roosevelt's president. He wants to make America a great power. And we go to war. The Maine is sunk in Cuba Harbor, right? And uh, remember the Maine. And we go to war with Spain. We fight in Cuba. We win. We take over Cuba. We take over the Philippines. We take over Guam. We take over Saipan. We take over Puerto Rico. We have all those places today, except the Philippines. And we left Cuba and we made them an independent nation, except for Guantanamo Bay, which we kept. It's our prison. That's our history. Okay? <laughs> After that, Theodore Roosevelt lost. Wilson becomes president. We retreat again. World War I happens. Grudgingly, the United States comes into the war. We go over, we save Europe. War ends. League of Nations is going to be established. The United States says, no, we will not join. And we withdraw all our people. And we withdraw behind our oceans. And we say, enough of the world. And we forget the world. And what happens? 
World War II happens. <laughs> so the United States is dragged back into the world. During World War II, all the European empires are destroyed. They are destroyed. They go bankrupt in the next decade after World War II, from the Dutch in Indonesia to the French in Africa to the British in India. All of the empires crumble. And the United States is the only game in town, except for the Russians. And the Russians are devastated. 25 million dead, their entire economy wrecked. Everything's death and destruction. The United States is untouched. Not any of our cities were bombed. In fact, we boom, right? We boom. And we are the masters of the universe. So now we have this question. Are we going to go back to isolationism? Everybody says no, because isolationism brought us World War II. And the British are gone. We have to step up, and we have to keep the world order. And that's what we did. And we've done that ever since. We have been engaged in the world. And that's why we have bases all over the world. Wherever the American bases are, there's stability, there's trade, commerce, prosperity. That's why the world, that's why poverty has been reduced. What, in the last 10 years, a billion people have been lifted out of abject poverty? A billion. And they'd say by 2050, that category of humanity will cease to exist, all things remaining equal. It will be gone. There will be no more abject poverty in the world. The world is prospering in ways that is unprecedented in the history of the world. It's all because of the United States. The United States has our, na our Navy is everywhere in the world. We have 14, uh, 11 uh, super carriers, and we have 10 marine carriers, or 14, 14, my bad. So we have about 25 carriers in some capacity. Nobody else has any super carriers. There's not one super carrier in, in the world other than an American. And everything else is equivalent to our marine carriers, which are like helicopter carriers, minus the 3,000 Marines they carry. Our Navy patrols the, the, the oceans and allows for commerce. And the commerce is unrestricted. You can trade all over. That's why we have all these cheap goods coming from everywhere, and everybody can just buy stuff, and they don't have to think about it anymore. All the things that we wear, everything, right? It's all for this prosperity from the American. It comes from engagement in the world. But there's a lot of Americans who say, I'm sick of the endless wars. I'm sick of all the, the costs that we pay. We have got all this stuff. Why are we all over the world? We need to become isolationist again. We need to retreat beyond our oceans and say, enough to the world. You go do your stuff. We're going to do our stuff. And we're done with you. It's very strong in the United States right now. Probably at least 50% of the United States thinks that, maybe more. It's a big decision, because if we decide to do that again, it will have worldwide ramifications. It will have worldwide ramifications. Not only with the, the, the vacuum being filled of American power, but in terms of how you buy things and sell things and banking. and Any and everything that you can think of will be touched. By, by this decision. And every American needs to think about it. It's really important because the, the, our history is isolation. That's our history. That's George Washington. That's who we are. Our economy is based, what? More than 90% of our economy is America. We, we really don't need the world. We, can, we have our own oil. We have our own food. We have everything right here. We don't need the rest of the world, but the rest of the world needs the United States. There are every economy, my wife's country, South Korea, it's an export-driven economy. Germany, export-driven economy. China, export-driven economy. Japan, export-driven economy. When those economies cannot send their goods to places like the United States, what do they do? They implode. And when they implode, what happens? Then you have internal strife. You have civil war. You have country. You have governments which, which want to distract the people, and so they get aggressive with their neighbors. This is the history of the world. This is how the world worked until the American century, or the Romans, if you want to go back 2,000 years with the Pax <laughs> Romana, right? So this is how things work. We have to, you have to think about what you want as citizens, because what you decide 
has ramifications. Your views are important. They affect a lot more than you know. There you go. Go forth and prosper. Did you have a question, Troy? Oh, just a comment. I was buying bananas the other day. And it says right on it, product of Guatemala. Absolutely. Now, that is a perishable. What's more perishable than a banana? Yeah. And I'm holding this piece of fruit in my hand that came probably 4,000 miles. It's and I paid right. $1.49 a pound for it. Mm -hmm. You can ship a pound of sand for $1.49. Yeah. That's not far away. I mean, it's just like. Well, next time you buy a packet of t-shirts, look where they're made. Bangladesh, probably, or Vietnam. Yeah, it's, it's and you buy gross. them a pack of a pack of six for ten bucks or twelve it's a, bucks. It's a truly global economy. That's pretty amazing. It's very really fragile. So, do people around the world respect us? Because in a lot of ways, yeah. we're very. Can, can I answer that though? Yeah. So I was in Vietnam. Yeah. And I was talking to this fellow who was our tour guide on the, on this bus and. He said, he was older, he's my age, and he said that in 1975, when the Marines left, we were looking at the hotel yeah. in Ho Chi Minh City, Yes. right, where that last helicopter took off. We were standing there, right there on the pavement, talking about it. And he said, when the, the Americans left, the North Koreans came down into the cities. North Vietnamese. And, or North Vietnamese, sorry, and we fled to the jungles. And they brought all of the North Vietnamese populations in that took over our homes, that took over our houses, our businesses, everything went in, and we fled to the jungles. And then after a few years of living off of rodents and snakes and things that we could find. Which are delicious. Which are quite good. <laughs> and he, he, said, he said then the, they finally got organized enough to where we got a lottery ticket that we could go to the grocery store and we would get our turn about every two weeks. But when we got there to shop, we found out that the market owner had sold most of the goods out the back door for quadruple what we were supposed to pay for it. And we couldn't get all of that stuff, and blah, blah, blah. And then he just said, thank heavens for America, right? He just was, he praised the Americans. He loves the Americans. He loves democracy. He loves freedom. Because he lived in a time where he saw glimpses of it pre um, preoccupation of the of the North North Vietnam. So many of the regular citizens of the world who have been influenced by freedom uh, appreciate and love Americans. Correct, Bart, or no? No, that's absolutely right. I think it depends on the country, and it depends on a lot of different things. American culture is dominant. Take American music. American music is everywhere, all over the world. You go in the deepest, darkest uh, jungles of Africa, and you're going to hear hip hop. Because I've done it, I've been there. And that's exactly what they, they're playing. They've got videos of everything that you can see here, and they're playing it. You go to Eastern Europe, it's the same thing. Blue jeans, all that coke, it's, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. American culture is all over the world, but it's not necessarily the same as loving America. Yeah? So you have people that, like this fellow, who aspire to come to the United States and have an American dream. And then you have other people who look at the United States as an oppressor nation. A lot of the Muslim world views us that way. Mm -hmm. Or a lot of people in Europe who see us backing, say, Israel, when they're, when they're blowing the crap out of, out of Gaza, right, and Hamas. And they'd say, ah, oh, the, Ameri the American bombs are using that. They're the, the Jewish state, and they're killing children. Hmm? And the Americans are enabling that. So there's a lot of dislike that way. Or a lot of people don't like Mr. Trump and his rhetoric. And so they, they say, ah, oh, these Americans, you know, this is, this is bad too. And then we have trade problems with people, mm -hmm. right? We, we want to slap a tariff on somebody for steel or, or sugar in Brazil. That affects people that are on the ground. You're a sugar planter, you're, you're, you're producing steel. That's, you don't like that, right? There are ramifications, and so it's a, it's a complex question. It depends on who you are and what you're, how old you are. If you go to Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe is far more pro-American than Western Europe is. Surprising. Because I think sometimes, and you hear it sometimes on TV, that we're kind of arrogant mm. as a nation, you mm. know, that we're so prosperous in that, and then you know, that's why I ask about why did Osama bin Laden 
farmers, you know, and yeah. stuff, and, and um, you know, I think America had a humbling when that happened. And, Absolutely. And, that, and then time goes on, mm. and, and we get arrogant again. It's in the scriptures, you know? <laughs> And, there's there's a lot there's, there's all kinds of it, it's complicated. It the is. world relations are, are complicated. Yeah. And if your if your view as an American is to be popular in the world, that's a different idea than to be respected. Yes. So if you read The Prince with Niccolo Machiavelli, very small book, I recommend that all of you read it. It deals exactly with this. And his 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 uh, his advice is it's better for a prince a king, a president, a country, to be feared than loved. Because if you're feared, you, you, have, you have at least the power to hold on, right? A lot of times, people that love is a fickle thing. It changes rapidly. Mm -hmm. The people that loved us for the Berlin airlift huh, in Germany, those people were all dead. And the young Germans generally think the United States is a force for bad or evil in the world because we're not part of the Paris Climate Accord or because, you know, we're whatever. So there you go. Okay, all done? Yeah. Awesome. All right.